it's not going to your organs. So your liver, your kidneys, your lungs, your heart are not getting the support from your body that they need because you've given your body this very strong signal that it needs to go to muscle. Mm -hmm. So if you were to stay on a huge amount of androgens for never mind years, decades, yeah, that's when you see organ damage, things start to grow, you know. So it's it's probably a wise idea for most guys to come back. And the other thing is, like you said, if you if you were to sort of gram a test all the time, that's it becomes homeostasis. Your body's yeah. like this gram is now normal, right? You're not going to get anything out of it at a certain point. So it's what do you do? You got to go up, but you can only go up to a certain point before things fail. Yeah. yeah. It's time to sit down, keep it real, and cut the bullshit. Welcome to Table Talk. All right, guys, we're back with another episode of Table Talk to my, today, da, 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 my guest is Kurt Havens, and trying to figure out how to introduce you, right? So it's, you're, you're a coach, uh, science-backed health, physique development, it's kind of what it says on your site. Mm -hmm. We'll get into your origin story a little bit, so we'll fill in the gaps here, but you first started coaching in 96, yep. Founder of Atomic Life, mm -hmm. husband, father of two, PhD candidate in endocrinology. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the jump off question, right, <laughs> is why go back for the PhD in endocrinology? Because I believe that was in 2020. Why? So I, the coaching thing wasn't really in the forefront at that time. Mm -hmm. um, so I was more focused on going back to school. I was, I worked, um, I did pre-med when I was younger undergrad and then I got out of that field and I worked in the fashion industry for a long time and that ended the company I worked for. They lost millions of dollars in stock and they did a bunch of layoffs and I was looking for what my next move was going to be. And I decided I was going to go back into science. So I was, I was following that career path and um, I was literally watching. So, and I'd been coaching, like you said, for the majority of my adult life, uh, since college, but it was never like a full-time mm -hmm. thing. And I was watching YouTube last summer, literally a year ago. And I reached out to Paul Barnett who says hi. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, we talked for a while and at the end he said, Hey man, you, you got to make your your profile on Instagram public. At the time I had a private thing and it like family pictures and my wife, it mm -hmm. was just whatever. And I said, what am I going to put up there? I was like, exercise is so overdone. This millions of <laughs> things like people lift weight. No one cares. Yeah. Um, and he said, make science cool. And that always stuck out to me. And I went home that day and I said, you know, I called that guy, Paul, you know, on YouTube. And he said, I should make my, my, uh, my profile public. She said, my, my wife said, mm -hmm. um, I've been telling you that for years. Of course, we never listened to our spouse, Exactly. Right? So, yeah. Of course, I, I never. I, yeah. Never and you, you don't want to say, yeah, I remember. Yeah. So, <laughs> um, so and, and I said, and he said, make science cool. And so we're like, well, that's interesting because everything is so overdone. What are the mm -hmm. odds that you can actually nowadays start and actually find success doing this? Right. So I went home and I took all my family photos and I we put them on her profile, which is private, right? Again, I, I think there's something to be said about keeping certain aspects of your oh, life yeah. private at this point, right? I, mm -hmm. You know, and- Especially with kids. Yeah, it just, you know, and so, and then I, I just started writing content. I mean, I had been, this is stuff that I had done in school or, you know, honestly for fun for years and years and years. So it just came natural to me. I didn't realize that people didn't understand anabolic steroids at all. And I started going through other people's content and realizing how much garbage there was out there. Mm -hmm. I mean, just total junk. I mean, it just misinformation and it was on both sides. It was on the fitness industry and it was on the medical side, right? So that, you know, in regular medical school, um, they have these, they're, they're generally called blue books and they're on each major subject. And the endocrinology one is like this big. If I gave it to you, you could, you probably memorize it in two weeks and take the test. Mm -hmm. It mentions testosterone once or twice. It doesn't really go over what it's doing outside of, you know, um, androgenic traits when you're going through puberty and things like that, um, as a reproductive mm -hmm. hormone. And, and they basically mention steroids a couple of times and they basically just say they're horrible for you. 
And I was, so this is what doctors are coming out of school, a general practitioner yeah, is coming out yeah. of school learning, right? So this is where part of that issue starts, right? And there's no, we can go farther into some of the estrogen stuff that you see yeah. nowadays too, that's also not correct. There's just a lot of garbage that's being put out there uh, by people that just don't fully understand the subject. Um, so a lot of it just came natural. I just started writing and writing and writing. And I wrote a growth hormone book. I don't know if you've seen it. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I was working right after, right when I was talking to Paul, I was working, I was managing like a local gym. It was like an indoor, um, sports facility, like batting cages and stuff. And it was in the summer. So it was dead. I brought in three computers and I wrote the book in two weeks. I had nothing to do. I just sit there. My family went on vacation. I literally had just had to sit and watch this empty gym. Yeah. And I wrote the book in two weeks, um, along with my content and, and the rest has kind of been history. It's gone pretty much vertical since then. So I started coaching online, I guess, August. And my revenue was strong enough after that two weeks after writing my book that I was able to quit my job. After the two weeks? After writing two weeks. And then it went up eightfold every single month since then. Just the growth hormone book? No, well, the growth hormone book, I probably sell yeah. two to three a day. No, yeah. but just the coaching. Okay, the coaching. The coaching the co just the whole thing. Yeah, okay, the whole thing okay, went okay, up. Yeah. And then yeah, that a lot sense. of guys... I always try to remember where I, you know, I, I came from. So I think it's important yeah. um, to pay attention to those things. Guys like Paul Barnett and Vicar Steve and Wesley Vizzers saw something in me early on and allowed me to go on their shows, you know, and they really helped me. Yeah. So that's something that I focus on now is trying to pay that back to other people that I, uh, that I see talent in is trying to help them out. Mm -hmm. This industry, because it is a, t I mean, you know, you've been doing this yeah. a long time. It's a tough industry. Well, for a long time, you're an outsider looking in. So if we go way back, I think you started coaching people in like 96 or something like that. Kind of, right? Yeah. Um, because if it's not that primary focus, it's a strong secondary, but a number one hobby. Yep. Right. So that'd be a way to explain that. And then there was the EAS things that used to go mm -hmm. around. And yep. then at some point you were coaching for EAS or how it's did that not official. Work? So, yeah. um, so I, that's about when I got into bodybuilding was in the mid nineties. Um, I was natural mm -hmm. and I could always get really shredded, but I was very light. You know, I could, I could get peeled, but I was 140. Mm -hmm. Um, and I entered the first body for life challenge at, I don't remember what year that was. I think it was 95 or 96. I don't know if you remember this stuff. Mm -hmm. He did uh there. So there was no internet. This was what like as Bill Phillips, as far as marketing is concerned, was pretty brilliant. Big time. Right. Like he took, he basically took over. He started EAS, right? He took the creatine, uh, Scott, yes. I remember his name, had the patent for creatine. He basically Blew bought the rights up. for that. Mm -hmm. And said, I need actually a way before to... that, didn't he have uh, the meal replacement? We right? had metrics. Yeah, yeah, so metrics. he actually owned metrics first. Yeah. Well, so he started, I'm not going to tell the full story here because I yeah. don't want to tarnish stuff, but uh, he actually started his career with Dan Duchesne. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you're aware of that. Yeah. And the two of them were doing the same kind of thing. Dan was more focused on staying on that direction. Yeah. He built. had um, he had a newsletter that was yep. sent out. Um, was, I can't remember. It was the, called uh, like a anabolic review. I can't remember what it was. <sighs> But it was it was actual. It was uh, it was John Ziegler's newsletter because mm -hmm. right? John, John Ziegler was the scientist who invented D ball. Yeah, it was something out along those yeah, lines. Yeah, yeah. And um, so Bill, I I might tell the story wrong, but I, basically Bill bought Metrics. It was a a meal replacement company that was they were using the stuff in hospitals in, in Colorado mm -hmm. where he lived, and he bought that and basically grew that, sold it, um, and then started EAS. And when he did, he decided to come up with an idea to push his products. So he did this transformation challenge mm -hmm. that was 12 weeks long, right? It was called Body for Life. Mm -hmm. There was no book at that time. And it was who could make the greatest transformation in 12 months, uh, tw 12 weeks. And it was, it was drug tested. The guys who won actually were tested like several times. Really? After. Yeah. I did not know that. It was that. very rigorous. Yeah. Like I knew the one guy in New York and he, they constantly would call him in like randomly. They would never give him notice. They'd be like, you need to go report to LabCorp to go get your blood drawn. Hmm. Uh, because it, Bill didn't want anything to tarnish his reputation, which makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I entered that first one. I obviously I didn't win. There were ten winners. Uh, I placed in the top one hundred. I got the certificate. I almost brought it with me because we found it the <laughs> other day. And it, it was kind of a way also to help him grow his business. Is he basically gave you the opportunity to be a success coach? Mm -hmm. So he was trying to figure out ways to kind of spread this even bigger 
without paying anyone. Interesting. So, so then, it's like multi-level yeah, marketing. So, and I don't remember how it was, but basically anyone local to you that was going to compete in the next challenge mm -hmm. somehow got in touch with us and like you would help them, right? Because yeah. you'd already succeeded in this thing. So you would aid them in their transformation. The first person I got was this woman. Uh, she was very heavy. I don't honestly remember her name. Um, and she made a crazy transformation. I remember like showing her how to run intervals. Like she'd never run before. She never lifted weights before. Um, she'd never eaten mm -hmm. six meals a day. Like Bill Phillips brought a lot of those things that you and I like don't even think about it anymore, right? Mm -hmm. Like eating multiple times a day or, yeah. you know, high protein stuff or fasted cardio, all of the things that bodybuilders were doing behind the scenes for 30 years. Mm -hmm. He kind of brought that to the forefront and marketed it as, yeah, you know, which was interesting at the time because, you know, I look at that and be like, man, this is just, just basic shit. This is never going to sell. You know, but you forget who it's being sold to. Yeah. And he sold it for $600 million when he <laughs> sold the <laughs> Yeah. Um, so, so that was kind of my first foray into really working hands on with, with people directly in mm -hmm. that capacity. And then I continued, then random people, you know, would see me in the gym, you know, I was in shape and guys would be like, Hey, you know, can you help me look like that? Sure. Mm -hmm. You know, pay me a hundred bucks and I would help them. So it was, it was very like unofficial for a long time while I was, you know, doing other things with my life mm -hmm. and it, um uh, yeah until until much more recently when it became my pretty much my primary career um i think the science end or the education end is important because it allowed me to speak at a different level and to some different platforms because i would hope to change someday some of the laws around anabolics i think some of the laws are really silly yeah like growth hormone for instance mm -hmm. right it's not a controlled substance but yet it's a federal offense to possess or sell without a prescription it's 10 years in jail to sell you sell some yeah. of the box of yeah. without a prescription it's 10 years in prison but it's not controlled is that just because it would be <clears throat> basically prescribing without a license i guess i don't know but i mean like testosterone's a you know a class three drug that yeah. makes at least a little more sense to me that there's a well, I, I guess what I'm asking is if, if, if the, if it was Xanax, would it be the same penalty? That's a good question. I don't know what the laws are for that. Yeah. Cause um, what I'm wondering is, is the law, you know, basically universal. being a doctor, but you're not. Yeah. Or cause that I sometimes wonder with a lot of the online coaches and mm -hmm. stuff like that, that they're, they're walking a really gray area there to where you can educate but you can't like recommend, you certainly can't yeah. prescribe, but there, <laughs> I'm sure we all know a lot of people that they're not in the gray area. They're basically what they're doing is not legal. They're yeah. just flying under the radar and not yeah. get caught until somebody does, um, <clears throat> which is becomes interesting territory, you know, and, and I don't really know if it is illegal unless they're selling it. Yeah. I mean, you get sued. So yeah. there's specific ways, you know, um, like lawyers will explain, like, again, you get sued for anything, it doesn't mm -hmm, really matter, but mm -hmm. there's specific ways that generally you're, you're taught to phrase these things. Like, you know, if, if you, you and I were talking about a cycle or something, I, you're not supposed to say, I would take this and this, right. Yeah. And this amount that's you're pretty much guaranteed. You're going to get in trouble doing that. You can say things like, well, I've heard that most guys use this mm -hmm. in this amount because you're not really telling anyone directly what to do. You're just retelling a story. Yeah, yeah. Right. And it doesn't mean it's factual. Yes. Or I have, so I have heard, you know, or I, I know have, a friend. I have dog. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. My dog. So I, I mean, that's, that, that's at least what I would believe most coaches should probably be doing mm -hmm. in that case. So when, um, before you started coaching, so if we go back, say, 2017, 18, 19, were you even paying attention to this stuff no, online? No. Um, if I was even on Instagram, I might have followed a couple fitness guys, mm -hmm. but it wasn't really at the forefront of my interest per se. And I, and I think that's why I didn't even realize how bad this stuff was until mm -hmm. I really started paying attention to it. But like I said, like I'd been reading your stuff. I was always into fitness. I just don't think I cared so much about social media. Mm -hmm. um, like you wrote something on T Nation years ago, 08, 09, you can correct me. You did an interview with Nate something. I don't know if you remember this. Keep going and I'll remember. Uh, what, and you broke it down into to different, there were different categories. Um, and the one that stuck with me, which is really funny because it stuck with me for years, is you talk about moderation. Yeah. Do you know what I'm talking mm -hmm, about? Mm -hmm. I, I'm the same way. I don't do anything in moderation. So, um, it's easier for me to apply that thought process to fitness, I think, than anything else, right? Yeah. That's why I don't drink. 
It's like, I can't do that in moderation. I don't smoke. I can't do anything remotely addictive in, you know, I, same with, you know, eating. I'm better just putting all my focus into eating healthy than eating mm-hmm. garbage. Yeah. I think I kind of explained that as like a blast or dust. Yeah. You know, if you're, if you're in one area, it's just 100%. And, but then, you know, everything else, kinda- it, everything else is just going to drop. But you need to understand when you're all in like that, at some point in time, it's going to crash. You know, you just got to figure out when you think it's going to crash to be able to pull back a little bit to kind of get around it or just bust through the whole thing. Yep. And which I thought based upon the environments that I've always been in, everybody was like that. Most successful people probably are. Yeah. To some degree. Right. I know the first with, with diet, I was very similar when I was younger, like we're going back to the nineties again, I stayed in very crazy shape for a long period of time. And it, took a toll, I think, on other areas of my life. I didn't really date. Mm-hmm. Right? I couldn't really mm-hmm. find any girl that would understand why I wouldn't drink, why I wouldn't yeah. eat pizza, all these things. And I remember the first time that I had a cheat meal, I literally drove from restaurant to restaurant to restaurant, and I just ate everything in sight. <laughs> and that was exactly that thing, right? So it was 100% all the time until it was nothing. Mm-hmm. And so I learned over time, right? It's not you can't really do the hundred percent all the time. It's for short periods of time. And I, I explain this to a lot of clients too. They focus, especially competitors, right? You can't give it your all, all year round, mm-hmm. right? There's a time to pull back a little bit and there's a time to push. You yes. can't push all the time with anything because yeah. yeah. it will break. Well, sometimes, and, and we'll get more into the coaching stuff as we kind of go on. Sometimes it's helping them to re, to kind of reframe what this, their all actually means, you know, because what, what I've seen more times than not is yes, they kind of are all in, but it's only for the things that they want to be all in for. And it may not necessarily be everything that they should be all in for. Okay. You get what I'm saying? So if you you can kind of cherry pick what it is that you're dedicated to, but as time goes on, say a decade into the Mm -hmm. whole thing, you start to realize, well, maybe sleep actually matters, (laughs) you know, and I was never all in there. So now then after a decade and being stuck, you got to start looking at every little thing. Yeah. Then you start to realize that, you know, having social relationships actually helps, you know, where going back, it's like, that's the last thing I want to do. You know, it's best to just be a hermit, yeah. you know, and kind of live in that area. <clears throat> so it's, it's always kind of questioning what that is, you know, because more times than not, it's usually just one or two things that they will be all in for, but they provide very convenient excuses to not do anything else. Correct. Like there's no B plan, no backup plan. Yep. Like, okay, that's really fucking smart. You know, so what are you going to do when you're not training? <laughs> totally. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? You're only in the gym for so long. You're only eating for so and long. And you can only push at that level for so long, right? I mean, yeah, you and I are older. Yeah. Like I don't push like I used to. Yes. I found a place that I can still either maintain or make slight progress, right? Without injuring myself, mm-hmm. right? I mean, the days of craziness are over. Yes. Like, I don't barbell squat anymore, right? I don't deadlift anymore per se. You can find the discipline in other areas. Yeah. Though. Just so, yeah, kind of just reframing. With your coaching services, if we look at, we just go kind of segment by segment, mm-hmm. then we'll get into the more chemistry stuff. With the, just the training aspect, mm-hmm. how do you approach, like what would be your training philosophy, I guess would be the question for, granted every client is going to be different. I get that. But if there's an overall broad training philosophy, what would that be? Well, first off, I believe in my athletes staying in shape all year round. Okay. Um, what do you mean by that? Define that. Like, I don't like guys to get, so I deal with mostly physique based guys. Mm-hmm. I have a couple strength guys. Uh, mm-hmm. I have a couple pro athletes, so that's a little bit different, but I like guys to stay in shape all year round to some degree. That doesn't mean they need to be able to walk on stage at any moment, but I, I'm not a coach that pushes food and weight so hard that these guys are getting overweight. Yeah. I know a lot of coaches like rebound guys really hard and blow them up um, because I'm also concerned with their health. So I think I try to accomplish their goals in the healthiest, fastest way possible without sacrificing you know, health. Mm-hmm. And I also believe in balance. I think it's very important for people, like we talked about before, about 100% to, to understand that you can still have a family and do these things and still be in great shape. You can still compete and be a father, right? Or a mm-hmm. mother. Um, whereas I see a lot of you know, disordered behavior where people just are focusing on one thing and everything else is falling apart around them. Mm-hmm. Um, 
So is the training then more bodybuilding based? I mean, yeah, there... usually hypertrophy based. Okay. Um, but again, it's, I have, you know, I have roughly a hundred guys at any given time, probably 70 to 80% of them are lifestyle guys, middle-aged. Mm-hmm. I get, I probably have a slightly different, different demographic than, than a lot of coaches. I get a lot of 35 to 50. I have some guys that are in their sixties as well that are just, they've just not been able to ever get in shape or achieve what they're, they're looking for. And they're just, they want to do this stuff. They're generally, generally they're on TRT or some sort of mild hormone replacement therapy. Those that's generally the guy that Mm -hmm. comes to me. I have a couple guys that are natural too, but it's mostly that demographic. And then the other 20% is probably competitors, both pro and amateur. So I deal with them a little differently. Yeah. Um, the safety thing though is paramount for me. I yeah. don't, you know. Well, the interesting thing with those two groups is if you take the the competitors and they're not top level competitors and they're in their so-called off season, they're really no different than the other gen- dem- demographic that you're speaking about. Where if I look at strength athletes, I kind of say that they're strength athletes in the gym and gen pop people outside of the gym. Okay. So you're going to find the same, you know, you're going to find the same weak points or areas or lacking what's the word i'm looking for um areas of improvement will be the same with them as they would be if you have a gen pop client because their lifestyle mirrors that outside of the gym okay you know more so than what people think because if they pride themselves on training really hard Right. So they go in the gym, they'll train really hard, really hard. Then they end up just like chilling on the couch, watching TV for four to six hours every single night, the same way that a regular person, the would. regular person yeah. would, you know. So what I try to through this podcast get out there is if I bring people in that work with those demographics to kind of double down on some of those areas, because they are the areas that most of the high end strength athletes, even body, well, bodybuilders, not so much because they have things dialed in a little mm-hmm. sooner, <clears throat> end up going to when, when longevity starts to catch, when their sport longevity begins to catch up with them. Okay. You know, they start to feel, you know, I'm coming to the end. You know, then they start looking at all these other factors. And it's so interesting to me that so many times their lifestyle factors outside of the gym mirror the the people that you're speaking about. Sometimes it's even worse. Yeah, I could see that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Bodybuilders probably are a little different. They yeah. tend to be a little more regimented with what they do day to day. That's also something I try to like, probably the same in the strength world too. A lot of the things that you and I do day in and day out that we've done for decades are things that we, these are habits we've built over time. Right. And mm-hmm. you and I come from a world where there was no internet, right? So there was a lot of trial and error. Mm-hmm. Um, and so you learn what works for you. It always seems to kind of be the same thing that's working for everyone else. Right? Yeah. There's a lot of common denominators there. Um, you and I probably have a lot of similar habits, mm-hmm. right? With food and with training, regardless if you're going for a PR or you're going, yeah. you know, to grow your arms. Um, and I just, a lot of guys get frustrated, I think, in the beginning when they don't, they're not able to nail those things right away, right? But it takes years mm-hmm. to get in these patterns, right? Like, I don't even think about eating anymore. I'm sure you don't either. Yeah. Like, I just know what to eat. I go mm-hmm. anywhere I know what to eat. Yes. Right? Yes. And guys, like, you give them a list of food and they're like, I don't know what to do with that. Right? Or you mm-hmm. ask them to say, like, they're not making, they're not making progress. And when I get guys like that, th- th- they'll say they're following you know, generally for most guys, I'll just give them some macros unless they fully mm-hmm. don't understand mm-hmm. how to measure stuff. They don't make, pro- if they don't make progress, I'll say, you send me a picture of what you eat, like in a typical day. And you see the pictures are like, that doesn't line up with what I gave you at all. Yeah. That's a good right. point too, because they don't know how to trade things out if they get stuck, yeah. you know, so they won't understand that, you know, beef, chicken, totally you know, turkey. Yeah. Or you know? <laughs> moving carbs up and down. Right. Yeah, like depending yeah, on what you're trying yeah. to do. Right. Like I don't even think that's not stuff I think about. Mm-hmm. I just naturally like a lot of one of the more common techniques I use with food, at least is carb cycling. It just, it, mm-hmm. it generally works pretty well. I don't generally follow it myself though. I, I've just always intuitively kind of done something similar, right? We eat more on days yeah. we train, we eat less on days. Like I, I've been traveling all day. I'm not gonna eat that much today. I just don't need to supply my body with that amount of energy is if I'm going to go do legs. Mm -hmm. So how do you go about that? Because there, there's pros and cons of everything, right? Mm -hmm. So 
I guess after I ask this, we'll go into the pros just so people know. But one of the cons of all that is if you're working with somebody that hasn't developed a habit of just eating four mm-hmm. or five basic meals per day, now you have you know, the carb cycling to where one day could be seven different meals compared. Mm-hmm. In other words, with if you got a high day, a medium day, and a low day, you basically have three different meal day plans. And it's confusing. That's confusing because they haven't mastered just one meal plan. You know, a, mod, a, mod, a medium day, for instance. So will you start them just with the medium days? Yeah. So what I do, yeah. so different again with body. Yeah, yeah, so yeah. usually, especially pros, right? They already kind of know what they're eating. Mm-hmm. Very rarely mm-hmm. do you have to like tweak. Sometimes their food is a little off. Um, actually, most pro bodybuilders probably eat too much protein. That's one thing mm-hmm. I always lower. These guys are eating 70 or 80 grams at a meal and it's just bloating their stomachs. Mm-hmm. Um, with No, with uh, lifestyle guys, unless they've had success with something or they have a better understanding than most, I, I generally start them the first week. I look at their photos. I discuss you know, what they've been doing in the past. Generally, it's no structure. It's yeah. usually where they come from. And I just give them a static calorie diet. Mm-hmm. And the only thing I might add is the, the post-workout might include a little more carbs than on a day you're not working yeah. out, right? Yeah. And I'll try to phase them into just eating more frequently, just getting used to eating a little more often, right? Again, the science doesn't fully back that up, but also the science doesn't study you and I. Like, yeah. Well, there's interesting, because I, I had a conversation with Jim Stepani about kind of this exact thing to where I think that kind of was around like the post-workout protein window, right? Of you know, the science is showing it's really not necessary as long as it's in there the whole time. But what's the negative of it? You know, especially if you're dealing with gen pop who, you know, I think I use the analogy of sex. Like if my wife wanted to have sex and I knew it was guaranteed, Mm -hmm. you know, 45 minutes after, I mean, guaranteed 45 minutes after training, no, Mm -hmm. not, no deviation at all. Mm -hmm. Now she might want to, you know, four or five hours later, but you never know. You know, the kids could have this thing and da, 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 da. So well, I'm going to go after the guarantee. Yep. You, so it's, and so that was kind of the conclusion that we came to is, yeah, they don't study, you know, bodybuilders and so forth and all that, but what's the downside? None. You know, so there's None. no downside. So, and then what's the risk? Well, the risk is I've had a lot of younger strength athletes that just due to work, the labor jobs or whatever it's going to be, they have a hard time getting their meals in. They have a hard time getting their protein in. You know, so I can put a small protein dose Mm pre-training, maybe a little bit intra and then post and pull in 100 grams of protein throughout that whatever time pan. And that may be, unfortunately, 70% of their protein intakes coming at that time period. Because they take that away. You know, now they're down to 60 grams of protein Which per is day. not adequate. Which is not adequate. Not even for disease. Yes, yes. So I broke your chain of thought. So continue. With no, I just, I, yeah. no, I think, so I typically, what I'll do is I'll basically just start with the static calorie diet. Because a lot of guys mm-hmm. are coming from a place where they're eating. I mean, we see all sorts of stuff. I, I get guys that fast most of the day. You know, again, there's, I have no, I have no dietary stigmas. I, you can make anything work, mm-hmm. right? Is it going to work ideally? And to go back to what you said for a second, just because they don't study us, but history leaves clues. There's very few guys that are big and strong and ripped that don't eat five or six times a day, mm-hmm. right? I don't know of a whole lot of them. Well, the other factor would be if, as they add more muscle and they get bigger, that's a lot of food to shovel in two meals two per meals, day. Yeah. So I just, I just try to get them in the habit. I might start with four meals a day, mm-hmm. right? Or I even revert back to like stuff from Bill Phillips, like uh, it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner, right? If they have a family and they can't, mm-hmm. they, you know, if they can't do that, you know, maybe it's breakfast, lunch, and dinner with a shake in between. Mm-hmm. There's no reason why you can't do that. In fact, most of the time I probably end up doing that now too, because I'm traveling, I'm busy, I'm with coaches. I can't be eating chicken while I'm on the phone. Mm-hmm. I can't be eating chicken while I'm on a podcast. Mm-hmm. So I've reverted back to some of those things just to make life easier. So I get guys used to a habit and I kind of see what their body does. Then I adjust. So I, unlike most, at least bodybuilding coaches, I talk to all my guys on the phone. So a lot of coaches just do the check-ins through WhatsApp or whatever. Mm -hmm. I'm on the phone with all of my people all the time, depending on what they have signed up for that just dictates the frequency. But I think communication is really paramount in their success. Mm -hmm. I don't know how I couldn't possibly coach at the level I do and retain my people if I'm not talking to them. No, I would agree with that. I mean, so, but no one does it. I'm Mm -hmm. apparently one of the only people that really does that. At least in the bodybuilding world. Yeah, that's a fascinating thing to me, especially with how fast GPTs are coming on, you know, and, you know, those that 
don't think it's going to replace just the basic programming or ignorant. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's very, very, very ignorant. But if you have that personal, uh, you have to, yeah. if you're in this field, you, you have to figure that out, you know, because it's way too easy, you know, to just prompt out whatever you want. Yeah. And then, um, and that's, and I'm in constant communication, but when we're done, I'll have 200 texts mm -hmm. from guys. I, I don't know how anyone does it without doing that. Mm -hmm. I couldn't do once a week check-ins, but that also leads to a higher attrition rate. I've, I, I maybe have 5% at the most. Mm -hmm. Well, then you're going to run into a problem that you can't take anybody else. To. Yeah. So I mean, bigger, worse problems. I have, yeah. I guess. Right. Mm -hmm. um, it's a good problem. To figure it's a good out. problem. Yeah. To have. So, um, yeah. So normally with lights, guys, I just try to get them in those basic habits first, right? Like when I first started messing with nutrition, I don't remember who, who taught me this. They said, a lot of people that are new at these things, they try to they try to t tackle the whole thing, and no one is, can do that. So, you, if you can get someone to change one, maybe two habits a week, right? Even one habit a week is fifty two new habits a year. Mm -hmm. You can make a huge change in someone if they change one yeah. thing a year. So, a lot of times, even dumb stuff like they're not drinking water. Yeah. Okay. Well, today, this week, I just want you to focus on drinking ten glasses of water. Like it sounds so dumb, right? Mm -hmm. From like the higher level stuff that we're looking at, but most people don't do the basic stuff. Here, I want you to use a high quality multivitamin, right? You look at their labs and they're deficient in everything. Yes. Right. Or just just silly stuff like that. So with the lifestyle guys, I generally, unless they unless they have a ton of experience and they can jump right into that stuff, I generally don't start with carb cycling with them right away. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, I mean, you mentioned the water thing, which is interesting as I'm drinking water, but is... I found that even with, you know, more advanced people, sometimes if you get into the weeds, you know, it's, say their hemoglobin's through the roof, but there's nothing else to really show that it should be through the roof. Then you ask them, you know, what's your water intake? I, and the oh, fuck, you know, I haven't been paying attention. Water. I just yes. take my clean with coffee. What do you mean? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, CPAP, uh, snoring too, will raise that a ton. Mm -hmm. So a lot of guys on gear snore, right? Yeah. They don't drink enough water and the hematocrit's through the roof. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not necessarily from the steroids directly. It's all the other things that's going on. Yes. Um, it just sleep apnea will do that. Um, but so, yeah, I mean, yeah, I think now, now we're kind of getting into the weeds though, because that, <clears throat> when you said you came back into the whole thing because of the misinformation, I, God, I don't even want to say that. I, I hate that word, you know, because of the information that out there wasn't solid, right? Where if I was to go see any physician, more mm -hmm. or less, and hematocrit's high, right? They're going to immediately say, it's, you know, it's uh, yes, or it's the TRT or whatever it's going to be. Even if the TRT, even if the test levels are 350, they're going to say that, of course. but they're not going to look into, you know, watch your water intake, you know, do you have sleep apnea? They're, they're not going to get down into those other weeds and in their defense, they're not trained to they're kind not. of, as you they're not. noted before. So you can't sit there and say that they're, they're stupid. They're, you, I guess we could say they're ignorant, right? Because they don't know, but not, not willingly. So, but that's it's, not their job. No. When you're in medical school, that that's not the goal. The goal yeah. is to fix the problem immediately at hand to treat, to treat immediately yeah. and not, you're not investigating everything else that's going on in their life, right? You don't necessarily know those details, nor will you ever know those details. You just have to deal with the problem at hand. And doctors also aren't taught, they're not taught every subject, right? And definitely nutrition. There's no nutrition class taught in medical school. So asking a doctor about food is a pretty silly idea, first mm -hmm. of all, unless they're more progressive and they've spent the time learning this stuff on their own. Most of them don't have a clue, but they also don't do things. They're also taught to not write for things that are actionable if they can't fix it. So this is why if you go to like a general practitioner, your regular, your family doctor, he's not going to check things like your thyroid, right? He might check TSH. He's not going to check your thyroid. He's not going to check your hormones because if something's wrong, he has to fix it. It's now his responsibility. So this is also right. So again, it's not that they're ignorant or they don't, they just, they don't want to find stuff that's out of their practice mm -hmm. that they have to now deal with. Yes. Well, I think it's interesting there though, too, because if they do the panels and this is, you know, with the advent of companies like Merrick Health mm -hmm. and stuff, it's, it's changing the game as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But if they say, see something that's off, you know, D, you yeah. know, there's supplement your D, but it may not be the D, it might not you be. know, it may it be, be magnesium. the magnesium, right? Yeah. That's kind of, there's other things that are feeding Vitamin into K. that and they don't know, you know, what that is. So you can be, so it becomes this weird thing to where they're, they're a little bit out of their scope, you know, of practice yep. because they're there to treat 
and the referral most likely isn't going to happen because this isn't like a life threatening thing. Long term, it could be. It could be, yeah. <laughs> but know? it's not. But the way insurance companies look at it is, it's not life threatening. Yeah. So when you, what were some of the big things that stuck out that kind of pulled you back in? Because you said you were watching this information. Was it information just? Was it growth hormone? Because that was what you wrote. Tell me, was it, or was it testosterone? What, what, what were some of the things that you're watching? You're like, oh shit. I just thought in general, I, the two, the two, we'll say the three, the three biggest things that I see that seem odd to me. And again, there's nothing wrong with them mm -hmm. you know, on, on the surface, but I think when you, when you look at them, there could be something wrong. Um, very odd TRT dosing, very low now. Mm -hmm. like doctors, we, we always joke, we call it the scared urologist. Because if you see a guy who's on TRT, he's on 100 milligrams, he probably got that from a urologist. Because mm -hmm. that's not an actual dose of TRT. Now, I think guys like Derek from More Plates, More Dates kind of also pushed it in that direction. And, but I don't think he did that intentionally. I think what he was saying was misinterpreted. Mm -hmm. We can get to that in a second. Yeah, 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 I, yeah. I'm not blaming, honestly, he's probably responsible for all of us even being here mm -hmm. to some degree. Um, I think the estrogen thing drives me nuts. Uh, the guys just run it super, super high. I see it routinely in the hundreds for a man when it's not in the hundreds for a woman. I don't know where where that came from. It is not. It is not. So estrogen is sexually dimorphic, first of all. It's not meaning it's the body. A man's body deals with it very differently than a woman's body. Mm -hmm. So it is not necessarily cardioprotective in men, right? Most men that go in for a heart attack, if you pull labs, they have high estrogen. It's not protecting their heart. It's not necessarily any more neuroprotective than anything else. It does have some function there, but having it out of range isn't any, it's not like, it's very American, like if a little's okay, a lot must be really mm -hmm. good. Estrogen is not something that needs to be out of range. It, there's no benefit. It's not, it's binding up, it's binding up IGF. It's not creating IGF. It's just doing all the wrong things, right? If you think of your typical high estrogen person, that's not really a look that you and I would really want to go yeah. for. Um, my wife and I joke about this all the time because she's like, I don't even do this and I could tell you that you don't want your estrogen high. Mm -hmm. um, so that I think that's a crazy thing that you see going on. And it's even preached by doctors, but again, these are doctors that were never taught about hormones. So I'm not really sure why they're even going there. Mm -hmm. um, and the other thing is, I think just crazy cycles, like, and then just too much in the beginning, right? Like the guys very young now using trend, yeah, yeah. using huge doses, like the days of like, you know, a first cycle like, 500 test. Like, is that really needed? Like, try 300 test. Mm -hmm. Because I see a lot of guys, if you, it, um, if your diet, assuming your diet and everything else is in check, if you can't grow for your first time on 300 milligrams of testosterone, might be time to pick another sport. Yeah. Well, it's interesting because you have, <clears throat> if you look in the time span that we've been around all this, right? So <clears throat> there, there's, there's two, camps kind of feeding into this over the past several decades. You know, the one would be, you know, <laughs> basically why waste a syringe? You know, if, if you're going to pull one in, you yeah. may as well pull the fucking three, three in yeah. because you're taking, you know, and so there's that. Then on the other side, there's the camp of, you know, steroids don't work. You know, if you go back far enough, it was on the actual package insert that it would not increase athletic performance, yeah. which is complete bullshit. So you kind of know that. And over the last several years, there's there's been this middle that came out, you know, and Derek may be, you know, kind of partially mm -hmm. responsible for that to even a conversation to be discussed. Because before that, if you had a conversation like we have, or if we're talking about that, it's it's going to get pulled off of YouTube, yep. right? Or the the athlete or coach didn't want to speak about it in the first place because there's still legality issues that surround all yeah. that. So they weren't lying. They just weren't being forthright. Which I get. You, you learn how to pivot, you know, the conversation, which um which is which is fine. But now the, there's more conversation. I don't think it's a bad thing. It just becomes more shit that you gotta kind of weed mm -hmm. weed through. But it's also changed a lot too, where my <laughs> My personal physician since like ninety whatever Derek Serrano, you know, no, so I, I just know. yeah, so I just saw him the other day in my labs. My test is it's terrible, right? So it, it's funny because when I first started seeing him, it was all about why are you taking all this. You know, just like I love taking the shit, right? So why are you taking? You don't need to take all this shit. You know, basically trying to get me off. You know, to begin with, and now we're 
and we're laughing about this we're because he's he's busting my balls he's like i can't believe you can't remember to take your shit you were the guy you <laughs> know that's like you're looking forward to it all the time yeah. now you can't fucking remember and i said oh, wait a minute i can flip this on you and say you were the guy that used to tell me to not take the shit and now you're jumping my ass because i'm not taking it you know so it's it's definitely changed over the years and it seems to be all you know testosterone based yeah when when you look through it and the dosing you said you wanted to come back to derek with the dosing structure so go into that a little bit yeah i just and again i don't i don't want to misquote him yeah, yeah i do have a lot of respect for the guy i'm not uh i in a few videos he had just talked about how to set up an effective cycle and he was saying you use a tolerable dose of testosterone right when you can no longer tolerate it without accessory drugs mm -hmm. then you add an anabolic I agree, and I don't. I, I don't fully agree with that. I I don't think he's wrong, but I think what it's done is it pushed a lot of guys because I see them that are on now because doctors now are prescribing these really weird low TRT doses. You see guys on 100 milligrams of test that want to add Primo. Why would you add Primo ball into 100 milligrams of testosterone? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it's like, <laughs> why don't we work that. on the test first and get that to a reasonable level? So, and, and I've said this on other podcasts too a lot. You know. It, and he's also talked about TRT, true hormone replacement yeah. therapy is, you know, what, 120 milligrams, you know, once you subtract mm -hmm. the ester. The problem is technically in the United States, TRT is 200 to 250 milligrams a week. Mm -hmm. That's why it comes measured like that in a bottle. So doctors don't want you measuring because they know most people can't do math, right? They ask people once with the quarter pounder and the, and the third pounder and they asked people which was bigger and people felt the quarter pounder was larger. So you don't want people measuring their own medicine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's why most <laughs> drugs come in the dose that's given. That's why the doctor gives you a one ML syringe and one ML is the, the correct dose, mm -hmm. right? He's not like, cause then it gets even crazier now. Cause now they're like sub Q with an insulin needle and the units and, yeah. and, and the guys are like pulling out point one and like sticking in their mm -hmm. stomach and they're doing that seven days a week. It's like, where did this madness come from? Yeah. Fill the syringe, put it in your butt. Yeah. Like that, that's the way it's supposed to be done. If you look at every study, it's done IM, right? They all say deep intermuscular injection. Yes. Right. So when you're dealing with the frequency though, because that's the frequency point can that, change that for, but how much it depends. I mean, if someone's really aromatizing that high, if they don't have a polymorphism, get their body fat down. Mm -hmm. It's generally a body fat issue. Yeah. I know I stay pretty lean all the time. I, you know, I can use over a gram and not have, need an AI. Mm -hmm. My estrogen doesn't go above 40 generally. Well, I, I'll hear weird shit, you know. So what I hear is it would be, you know, gym talk type of stuff. And, you know, sometimes that will evolve around, you know, if you're just taking the testosterone, sipinate or ethanate or whatever it is once a week, that's just worthless. You need to be taking it every single day, you know, sub Q or whatever it's going to be. And it will be more optimal. And I'm sitting there and I'm listening to this and I'm thinking a couple of different things. I'm thinking, so the last 30 years, the way people were taking shit didn't right. work, right? <laughs> yeah. So that's the first thing that it's kind of going through. And then my second question would be, well, what's the compliance going to actually be, you know, of this, you know, so if they're missing three or four of those seven days, now the yeah. dose is half, yeah. you know, what it's going, going to be. And, but if you go down these rabbit holes online, sometimes, you know, that I can see that where the confusion will come in. Cause you have a, one camp that's just, this is what it has to be. And then the other one, not. And so what would be the, endocrinology what, what would be the answer to that i mean what's really going on with when you're speaking about a half-life and the life that it's in because that's where the conversation comes is you want to keep that yeah, steady, steady straight yeah right? and so that's why the esters were invented yeah right? they started inventing these in basically in the 40s and they and, and the, the science probably progressed until the 70s mm -hmm. right? we're really not going anywhere with esters now we do some things with other strange things like buclinate and things like that for special situations um but basically i mean like if you're using like most guys in the u.s are using sipinate because it's mm -hmm. what's typically prescribed right so we're going to guess on the half-life of that because that's actually not known oh really so, so the problem is uh mpp sipinate and parabolin which is no longer really made some underground labs might make parabolin when you have that uh that extra ring that that phenyl group it weighs more because it's an oxygen than the straight carbon so a normal ester like an anthate is you know a straight carbon chain and you can basically count the carbons and that'll tell you half-life mm -hmm. 
when you add that ring there, it changes the way it's broken down by the esterases in the body and also changes the half-life. So it's actually unknown. If you go, if you look up what the half-life of testosterone sipinate is, says similar to testosterone and amphate, actual pharmacokinetics are unknown. So it's why it's not studied. So in any study with testosterone, all the stuff Bazin that mm -hmm. you're referring to in the 90s did was always an amphate because we know exactly what it does. We know it's predictable. So I, I've always found, you know, if, if you're going to use... I went on a tangent about sipinate, but if you're going to use one of those longer esters in amphetamine or sipinate, you could probably get by with just injecting it twice a week, right? So all esters, propanate included, they basically start to peak in about 24 hours and then they start to taper down mm -hmm. depending on the ester. As long as you're hitting it every four or five days, it's you're not going to get such a lull, you know, and mm -hmm. then it's, it's when doctors do the every other week thing that you're getting <laughs> these crazy, right? And also if the bigger dose is given, if you're giving all the whole dose, you know, if you gave 300 milligrams in one shot, and then waiting two weeks, you're clearly going to get a drop. Mm -hmm. But I, I mean, from a pharmacological point of view, there's no necessary reason to do it every day. Like I get that it's in theory, it's more stable, but the ester is already controlling the stability to some degree. Yes. You know, it just seems silly to me. The, the, the sub Q thing is also kind of crazy oil. I wouldn't put oil under my skin, mm -hmm. right? That's for yeah. peptides. GH goes under your skin. Mm -hmm. Oil should go on the muscle. That's it's like, if you, I don't know if you've ever done that. It just oh, yeah. needs a lump. It's gross. It's, yes. And it's itchy and it's, um, and it wasn't designed to do that. And the, the insulin thing though, where that came from is patient compliance. So now that HRT has grown, it's this massive industry, right? When 10 or 15 years ago it was right. It wasn't very talked about. Like mm -hmm. you might go to the doctor, but you know, you didn't discuss it with your friends. It was definitely not on the internet. Um, cause it was, and now that it's like more popular, a lot of guys, the doctors are terrified of needles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Like I'm supposed to stick that where and how mm -hmm. often? And so they figured for patient compliance, if you give them an insulin, it doesn't hurt, right? And you make them do this little tiny amount, they don't even feel it. So that's kind of where the, the origins of that came from. It wasn't so much to make it steady. And then I think people then elaborated on that just to, you know, to hold a level steady. Well, the, the difference in physicians' approaches baffles me. You know, it, it really does because I have, I have friends that will use, you know, private pay companies, you know, America or private pay pharmacies, and there's really no issues, you know, if you're, if you're going that route. <laughs> Where I have other ones that, um, one I was just speaking to a few weeks ago that was asking me, you know, how long do I need to go off my shit to get the testosterone to tank? Because I know I have to go see the physician again because the six months is coming up and I want to make sure it's low. And I'm like, why do you want, why do you want to do that? And he said, because if it's too high, he's going to reduce my dose, you know, the prescription. And I'm like, you need to find a new Better person. Doctor. Yeah. Like all, all your, basically all this person is doing the patient level is that's his source, you know, for real shit. Mm -hmm. Right. And it's, it's like a CC a week. I mean, it's not even, it's not even worth maintaining no. the relationship for, especially if you have to do shit like that. That's crazy. You know, and it's like, so you have to purposely tank it. You know, it's like you're going back 20 years to when maybe it's too long when you would you're trying to get the first prescription and you're staying <laughs> you up all night, yourself, you're yeah. drinking whiskey even though you don't drink. You just do perfect, everything you can, everything you can for it to be low, and then you're just right above. Yeah. You know, it's like fuck. Okay, with 350, it needs to be 300 or whatever. Yeah. I'll be back next yeah. week or what. And but it's crazy how that whole shit operates to where you know my TRT dose is higher mm -hmm. than what's normal Minus two. and it's and it's it's because i've used it for so fucking yes. long yeah, right so it, it's, it's not because i want it to be higher even though maybe need i more. do but i just need more for no that. and that's even with body yes. they have to use yes. more to get a result so it's 400 milligrams so it's just high enough that if i don't go to a private pay pharmacy then all of a sudden the pharmacist has got issues you know, and the insurance company has issues and they're calling the doctor to figure out what the fuck is going on, yep. you know? And so it's the way to circumvent that is just cut this off private pay. Insurance isn't covering that much anyhow. And certainly no, not enough. It's not that expensive, yeah. so. And not enough to, for the headache of the physician to say, fuck it, I don't want to deal with this anymore, which many have, you yeah. know, they just won't deal with it. I get it because they don't want, they don't want the heat from it because there's no guideline. There's no legal guideline for the blood level. It's so it's not like if you have your blood drawn and it was 2,300 nanograms, it's not like the doctor can be like, I, you know, I can't write it. It's, you're too high. Yeah. Assuming you've, you're already on TRT. It's 
it's more if he gets audited, he has to show that at one point, at least, you were hypogonadal. Yeah. You can't show that you showed up the first day with a 2,000 nanogram level test yeah. in your blood and he wrote you for TRT because that's not valid. But there's no, there's no law that says you can't be over a certain amount. It's not like the doctor has to keep you below 1,100 or he loses license. No one checks. I know. It's in there. It's to protect them if the DEA or someone audits what they're mm -hmm. doing. But no one ever does that. The pharmacist is the one always causes the problems, right? They look. Yes. So- um, I have a prescription of growth hormone and the state I live in, it's, uh, you have to have HIV. Mm -hmm. Basically I have one kidney. I was born with one kidney. So I, on paper, I have chronic kidney disease. Um, do with that what you will. Yeah, uh, yeah. so it's just funny because it's not so when I, if, when, if I go to a local pharmacy to fill it, it's funny cause I always get funny looks because they, they know that it's only for HIV, although it says chronic mm -hmm. kidney disease on it, mm -hmm. um, or delayed growth, and I'm not young enough that that's, a, that's an issue. But it just, it's just the same kind of thing. Like, it's always the pharmacist that wants to make a stink about things. I have a, a interesting growth hormone story for you that <clears throat> I, I don't know how many years ago it was, but it was, it was, a, long, it was a long time, maybe a decade ago. <clears throat> I had a prescription for growth hormone, I went in to get it filled. Then I saw how much it was going to cost because the insurance does not cover it. And I'm like, that's cool. Just give me the one, like just one bottle is whatever it was. That's it. I'm done. And actually, I don't even know if I actually, oh yeah, I had to fill it because the rest of the story wouldn't pan out if I didn't fill it. So I filled it for like one week or whatever it was. And it's like, fuck this. I am not doing this. Expensive. I mean, it was ridiculous. <laughs> and then years later, we change insurance companies. And so when we changed the insurance companies on the intake form, I never put that I had the prescription for the growth hormone because why would I? I feel, you know, one time I didn't really use it. It wasn't like a reoccurring type of thing. It wasn't even covered. You know, I had to private yeah. pay the whole thing. But this next insurance company, they cover it. And I'm like, fuck yeah, this is awesome. You know, I got four IU a day, you know, so I'm running this for a couple of years. Then I get a call from the representative of the insurance company for insurance fraud. Right? I'm like, what are you talking about? And it's like, well, we see that you filled this beforehand, but you never noted it on the intake form. And I'm explaining this whole thing. Like, look, yeah, that's true, but, you know, I couldn't afford it. You know, it was just like a week worth or whatever it's going to be. It didn't matter. You know, it's I was put in a position there to where now I was responsible for paying them back for two years of the growth hormone you 200 grand yeah, it was it was a lot man it was it wasn't that much but it might have been like 30 grand or some shit you know oh yeah well, over a, serastim is 5500 a box yes without insurance you know, so it's 270 thousand yes. a year yes and it was <clears throat> it was at a level to where you know because they're gonna let me pay it off over whatever period of time that you know you're like well i can get an attorney i can try to fight this i'm like i'm gonna lose no matter what attorney I have, because you know, we look who you're fighting. It's like, yeah. you're just fucked, right? Yeah. And since then, every single time that we've moved to another insurance company, I have like 10 fucking pages, <laughs> right? Of every medication, <laughs> over the counter and prescription that I've ever used they in my entire fucking life. So I never get into that situation again, it's So crazy. you know, with that. But there was a time, there was a time to where every month, because it was automatic refill, this was before testosterone got ridiculous too because i that script i used to just auto refill yeah. for a whole year and every month i'd be picking up the growth hormone i'd be picking up testosterone i'd be picking up um thyroid i armor thyroid mm -hmm. anson thyroid. you know basically it's like this is a fucking amazing it sucks that i'm retired you know yeah. and it's all basically trt yeah, whatever you want to call that it's health related where if i would have had this when i was competing would have been fucking amazing but it comes back to bite you on the ass where the um, staying on topic though, because I went off topic there a little bit, is so the the testosterone you kind of see being whacked with those conversations that are happening online, which I think everybody kind of sees that. And it's just evolved past then with the was growth hormone. I mean, why why the growth hormone book? So I I, I think growth hormone is really fascinating and there was nothing else out there that kind of compiled all the data, right? Mm -hmm. So it's one of the ones that you also see a ton of just bad information on um, and the way it's working, um, how to use it, what the dosing is. I don't go, my wife and I, she does my web stuff and my editing. 
we labored over a lot of the phrasing in the book. I really tried to avoid any direct, again, recommendations mm -hmm. to that stuff. I just didn't want everyone that to come back to me that I told someone to do X, Y, and Z. So I removed some of that stuff, but I was just trying to compile. I took 500 studies, all 500 existing studies on growth hormone as of last summer. And I just basically compiled them into the most readable format I could I could make mm -hmm. uh, so people could understand it, right? Because no one was going to search PubMed and read 500 yeah. studies. Most people don't have the access. They can only read the they can only read the abstract anyway. Mm -hmm. I can log in and read the whole thing. Um, no, I just I think growth hormone is fascinating. Like if I if I could only pick two things, I would say testosterone and growth hormone are probably the coolest things, mm -hmm. right? Which one would you say should be the anchor test? Yeah, and then why growth hormone over? Well, I think for things? guys our age. I think it makes a big difference in the way you feel your sleep. I mean, the sleep alone, I don't know if it's something you, mm -hmm. you're currently using or not. The sleep alone is unreal. Um, like sleeping in a hotel last night, normally before using GH, there was no way I was sleeping through the night in a hotel, right? The pillow's uncomfortable. The bed's uncomfortable. The temperature's off. It's just a strange place. There's noises. I didn't wake until my alarm went off. I mean, I take it, go to bed, you know, 30 minutes later, I can't even keep my eyes open. Mm -hmm. I'm out. Uh, I think body composition wise, it makes a huge difference. It gives you an extra, you know, at least a couple hundred calories a day extra that you can go over what you'd normally be able to push food wise without any body fat coming on. Um, I don't currently have any injuries or anything like that. So I can't really speak to the healing stuff for myself. Mm -hmm. it, obviously it does work for that. Um, I just think, I don't know. It, it definitely, I think it brings your, your composition back to when you were younger. And it also, it, so I'll be 49. It allowed me with my physique, I kind of hit a wall. Like I think everyone will hit a point, assuming they continue to do what we're doing, you mm -hmm. know, into middle age, a lot of guys stop, but if you, you'll hit a wall where you can't, your genetics run out, right? You don't yeah. have a ton of stem cells anymore. Mm -hmm. You're just not able to grow that tissue anymore. And it kind of allowed me to push past a point that I was stuck at for a while. And you could raise the gear, right? But side effects come with that. There's only so high that, you know, and everyone's tolerance is different. There's only so high you can bring gear up mm -hmm. without destroying your health. And if it doesn't happen immediately, it will happen long-term. I think the nice thing about GH is it allows you to keep the, the, the gear more moderate or even use just test, and you can still get a ton of progress out of that. All right. So when we're looking at this whole endocrine system, so let's back it off a mm -hmm. little bit and because a lot of people will watch these videos like is primo better than masteron you know all the clickbait mm -hmm. type of videos <clears throat> so if you were to explain just the endocrine system in its whole in its entirety because a lot of the things that if it's growth hormone test and all these other there's a synergistic effect mm -hmm. that's going to happen with all that where <clears throat> explained how the endocrine system works first right so people have a better understanding of how these things actually play in so it's it's a combination of your brain. Basically you have parts of your brain that dictate the endocrine system. Um, you have and glands and you have glands in other places in your body. And it's a constant, it's constantly monitoring. Your hypothalamus is constantly monitoring what's going on in your body. It's doing it right now. And it's constantly making changes as, as you do everything you do when you're eating, when you're drinking, when you're sleeping, it's constantly monitoring and, and adjusting levels depending on a situation. Um, and it's what it's basically, it's, it, it basically is all of the hormones in your body, both peptide hormones, which would be like insulin, glucagon, um, growth hormone, insulin growth factor one, or in a child, insulin growth factor two, and then the steroid hormones, right? From anything from, you know, right up from cholesterol, like pregnenolone, DHEA, mm -hmm. um, progesterone, testosterone, estrogen. So not all uh, steroid hormones obviously are anabolic or used. Yeah, for that stuff. It's just it's just a, a culmination of the, the glands in your body and your brain and how they interact with the other systems in your body. So everything is pretty much driven by the endocrine system to some degree. Um, and it's just and and the result of what those hormones do to different parts of your body, right? From linear growth when you're a child to body fat storage, to being able to eat carbohydrates, to um, being able to sleep, melatonin. Mm hmm. Uh, that's all, you know, it's, it's huge and, and it basically encompasses the, a large portion of our body, right? Even muscle technically is an endocrine organ because it, it, it secretes hormones and also uses hormones, right? It, it, its own IGF inside the muscles, actually what's doing the work 
Um, so that's, you know, in the, in recent years, they've reclassified muscle as an endocrine organ. So it's not just looked at as for locomotion anymore, mm -hmm. like it was for years. All right. So then <clears throat> before you get into, you know, the, the drugs that are, that impact all that, how does lifestyle impact this? You know, oh. so, so you have a lot of people that end up on TRT, but they're ending up on it because their lifestyle is fucked up, kind of yeah. led to that. Age is definitely going to lead it, you know, play into that factor as well. Yeah. I mean, there's the typical andropause, right? So mm -hmm. as we age, you know, it, it, testosterone levels will decline, you know, by a percent or two a year, you know, starting in the, you know, so for some people, even around 30 it starts mm -hmm. to go down, right? It's generally going to peak somewhere about 21 for most guys and start to decline. I'm just talking specifically yeah, yeah. men because women get, it's a whole nother, um, uh, and then all of the other things we do day to day will impact how your, what your hormonal health is, right? Your sleep is huge. Uh, your diet, the type of, even the type of dietary fat that you take in can affect these things. Um, if you wear tight pants, um, you, drug use over the counter drug use, uh, you know, like ibuprofen and stuff can, mm -hmm. can destroy these things. Um, antibiotics are estrogenic to some degree. Uh, the food, plastic water bottles. What else? Where am I going here? Pretty much everything. Pretty much everything. Degree. Smoking, drinking, drinking alcohol. Mm -hmm. um, so alcohol is a really interesting one. Alcohol will actually, right? Stops protein synthesis temporarily. That doesn't mean that if you have a beer, you're not going to get anything in your workout, but it's not really that wise if you're interested in being big and strong to drink a ton of liquor. It also stops the liver from producing IGF. So you're really screwing yourself. So alcohol will age you really fast mm -hmm. because you know, you're not, you're only getting, assuming you're actually sleeping, you're only getting the growth hormone segment of what's occurring in that pathway. You're not even getting the IGF if you're drinking all the time. One thing that I've wondered is with the low testosterone rates kind of globally, mm -hmm. you know, as things of, is it just the testosterone rates that are low or are they also looking to see if the DHEA and all these other you know, hormones or all these other players in the endocrine system are also low. You, you get what I'm they saying? All, yeah, they're all, they're all declining at the same time. Now, DHEA is a funny one because it is a precursor to mm -hmm. testosterone and, and a bunch of other things. We're not really sure what it does on its own. It's, it's the most abundant, um, we'll say, androgen, even though it's not technically acting in that way in the human body, but we're not really sure what it does on its own outside of being a precursor. So mm -hmm. it does definitely correlates with age. Like when you get your blood drawn, you'll notice that there's a range and you're probably, mm -hmm. unless you're taking DHEA, it's probably on the lower end. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's just because you're not just producing testosterone from scratch, right? So your lifestyle things are going to affect all the way down from cholesterol, you know, all the way up. Yeah. So it's not just a drop in testosterone. No, it's everything. Well, and, everything. And growth hormone is off too. Um, I mean, look at kids now. They're yeah. very different looking than when we were kids. Mm -hmm. Right? So, look yeah. in the seventy. How old are you? Uh, Fifty six. Okay. So, like, I was I was little in the seventies, but I do remember the seventies and early eighties. You know, you were you're ten years older than mm -hmm. not ten, five six years older than me. Um, but you, you remember like like every kid was thin. Yes. You know. Yes. Not, not like that anymore. No, hell no. I mean, if it was, and that's. Hi, <laughs> interesting, isn't it? Right, because there were a couple kids that were in class that would be yep. overweight, and those are the kids that were being made fun of all the yeah, time. But if you look at them in, in terms of today, it's they wouldn't reversed. be considered overweight. Yeah, well, it would be reverse, right? Because that would be, they would make up the majority. Oh, easily, you know. And it's I, you know, I've always heard that, but it didn't really register with me until my oldest graduated from high school, and we're watching the graduation ceremony, and you know, it's like. Oh my God, you know, it's now these are young adults at that point in time, but in my brain, it's like, man, this is, this is a problem, you know, and it's a small town too. And then half of, you know, my thoughts go all over them, but at least half of it, you know, kind of sympathetic to the child because it's not their fault. They're not buying the fucking food, you know, somebody no, it's, else, a, it's definitely a parenting issue. You know, it's a parenting issue, but if the parents don't know and they're ignorant and they're overweight, it's just perpetuating but it was it was the majority and it was a lot it was like fuck you know if they were really serious if they really wanted to take it off and they're really serious about it they're looking at a year at least you know if they're compliant you know and that's two years if not i mean that's that's a lot of fucked upness you know for a parent to leave to their kid you know that's kind of how i was seeing this yeah. is you know now the kid's out on their own and you've already put them behind the 
fall, you know, substantially because of this, yeah. but don't know, you know, because they're ignorant to the yeah. whole thing. When fat cells are part of the endocrine system as well, they, mm -hmm. they're constantly secreting different messages, right? So they send the wrong signals to your brain about hunger, right? Leptin, ghrelin, yeah. all these things are related to your body fat levels as well. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure the hormonal things are just going to continue to get worse because that, that generation of kids, when they're, right, they're already hormonally deficient mm -hmm. now at that age, they're going to have big problems in their thirties. Yes. So. Yes. And I, 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 want, I want to say, and their kids will be even worse, but they may not be able to have kids, you know? So, I, yeah. you know, that's kind of- It's pretty terrifying. Getting really terrifying and then, there. And then on the medical end, they, the pediatricians don't want to say anything, right? Because everything is very politically correct now, right? You can't call someone out for something. So, you know, they just kind of shift the charts, you know, they move the average, right? Because when they, when they tell your child based on height and weight, they're really just looking at averages. They're not telling you ideal. See, I wonder how that's going to change with, you know, the, were they GLP ones or the Ozempic and all that? Because now they're being heavily prescribed, right? For what reason? To be able to bring the weight down. But, you know, this is where it's like, wait a minute, like it wasn't a problem, right? I mean, that's what you all were saying. Like, this wasn't a problem. Yeah. Meanwhile, we all knew it was, yeah. but it wasn't a problem. But now it is, you know, because you have this peptide or, you know, that can help with that. So it's, it makes me wonder if those charts, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll start, to, we'll start to change back over time. You know, I don't know how I actually feel about that. We'll talk about it as, as it would relate to like prep, because mm -hmm. that would be interesting. But I don't know how I feel about it really on a societal level, you know, because there's a lot of pluses. You know, if you're taking somebody that's 200 pounds yeah. overweight and bringing them down and then they're doing it in a healthy way and changing style, yeah. you know, so I don't know there, you know, I'm fascinated by how it could be used in prep, you know. I would say with the general population, I would say the general population will still continue to get fatter over time. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's any pharmaceutical drug that's going to stop the industries that are feeding us and making our food from mm -hmm. making it worse, right? And making, and I also don't think human nature will outdo it, right? We're driven from nature to eat. It's one of the most, it's like the most basic need is food, right? Yeah. So we're, and the heavier people get, the worse that signal is. So they just can't control themselves. So I don't, I don't know if the GLPs will actually fix society as a whole. I think it's a temporary thing. And I think we'll just continue to out eat that stuff. Yeah. I see numerous people that are on the highest dose of some of those drugs that continue to eat like more than you and I. Really? Yeah. Because you become numb to it at a certain, it's just a signal, right? Mm -hmm. So if you can, you can just ignore it and just keep going. Interesting. It's wild. Interesting. So with prep, um, well, let's say for general lifestyle, I think, like you said, if you're doing the right things in your life and you're, you're changing your habits, I think it's a great thing because yeah. that, that signal is really strong. Well, I, I guess the point, the, the main point to kind of put out there is when we talk about these things, there's two different demographics we're speaking about, right? So there is, and that's why it's, it's hard to talk about sometimes because some people may fall on that side, mm -hmm. but then some people are going to fall on like the prep side, right? To where you can be, you can have two opinions about the same thing right i do all the time <laughs> you know yeah. i'm saying and it's okay you know it's like there's there's more than one way to kind of look at this to where you know i some i know some people that i've spoken to that are like a big fan of this during prep because it's going to control the hunger when things get really hard other ones are like fuck no you're just adding another thing in there now you know now you got 12 different compounds in your body mm -hmm. you can't possibly calculate the side effects of 12 different compounds in your body you know to be able to know there but that's a different conversation than mm -hmm. that gen pop type yes. thing, right? Yeah. Where the gen pop thing is the one where I'm like, I don't know what I really think about it, yeah. but it's probably, if I was to guess without really doing a super deep dive, it's probably a net positive as long as they yeah. can change the- Yeah. How, no. uh, and, weight, and being overweight is a yeah. precursor to pretty much every yes, disease. Yeah. So d just losing weight itself sure. is going to, should outweigh any negatives from the drug, yeah, unless, is, unless yes. they discover that there's- and nothing else you know, is being really done. Really horrible things done. Yes. And nothing that big, no. I should say. So I, so I, I support any way that people can get yeah. leaner. Yes. Like, now, when we get to that other side to where it's performance, because it's interesting, like every drug can become a performance drug. I swear to God. Yeah. I have, I've tried to like pray, uh, play mind mm -hmm. exercises. And outside of like fucking antibiotics, there's like nothing that I could think that could be. Yeah, unless you using. want to bring your estrogen up. For some <laughs> yeah, so they can all kind of be put in there. So how would 
or how are, you know, some competitors using that as part of their prep? I'm kind of getting ahead of myself as far as the drugs. I, I mean, go. It's some, I, it's, I don't think it's super common. There definitely are people that use it. Um, what would be the negatives of using it? Well, this, there are still unknowns about the drug, right? It's relatively new. It's not been tested. It's also not been tested when you come off, right? They don't know what the mm -hmm. blood sugar stuff is going to occur when you remove the drug. Cause I still see elevated A1C and stuff when people come off of it. Sometimes, um, there could be thyroid issues from it. There could be definitely stomach issues from it that are permanent depending, right? Gastroparesis and things like that. Now, again, those are just side effects of any, every drug has side effects, aspirin has side effects. Yeah, yeah. So I'm not, I'm not against that drug. What side effects would impact, because all those things, if I was to go back to when I was competing, all those things you just said, I wouldn't give a fuck about, right? But now if you bone said, loss. okay, now you're, you see what I'm saying? Bone loss, yeah, water again, the retention. The anabolic should, in theory, protect from the bone loss, but I don't, yeah. I, I don't, there's no data to support that. I can't say that, mm -hmm. right? We would think that using two grams a gear in prep or whatever you're using should fully protect your bones yeah but maybe it won't all right so for to go you know straight into the peds now we kind of laid out what the endocrine system does right so at the basic level say you throw testosterone in there what's disrupting and enhancing the endocrine system when you do that well it's basically everything works on a feedback loop and all the hormones are inter Mm -hmm. there's interplay between all of them so you change one thing it's going to change a ton yeah. of other things downstream um you're basically just shutting off the, the your natural production. So it's, you know, it's it's going to shut off a stream of things downstream that's going to tell your brain that your testicles don't need to produce anymore. Mm -hmm. um, and that generally, can, depending on what you're doing, right, how harsh, if it's just testosterone and the dose is not crazy, you've not done any permanent damage, most likely, unless there was damage done to the hypothalamus previously. It, it will come back on. Mm -hmm. um, uh like uh, steroids, not peptide, uh, but steroids, the way that they interact with the receptor, there is a longer period of shutdown than something like growth hormone per se, right? Like if you inject, if you injected two units of growth hormone right now, you know, by later tonight or in the middle of the night, your, your pituitary will be back online making growth hormone again, versus if you inject a CC of testosterone, yeah. you're not producing testosterone tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So, and, and that's not just ester related, just the way that the, that feedback mechanism works. Yeah. Um, so when guys start to do drugs, they clearly just have to take that into consideration that they might be creating a permanent situation for themselves, right? Now, if they were to start test and it's, when I was younger, there was a guy I was talking to that was taking tests and, or steroids, whatever you want to call them. I mean, we're going back to the fucking eighties, right? And I remember asking him, you know, how, how many cycles has he been on? And he said, just one. But I never stopped. It, it started in like 1980 and yeah. it was like 88, right? Yeah. And so if, if there's that long term use of never coming off, then is there that likelihood that it will never come back online? Yes. Now we don't know that for sure, but yes, mm -hmm. most likely. Or never. And even after every single cycle, like if you were to do a cycle, a standard cycle, 12 weeks and you came off, which I don't also recommend that people come off drugs like that. Yeah. Um, if you were to like generally, you know, one to four months, depending again, what the compounds were used in, but is the level going to be the same? If you were like a 400 nanogram, you know, per deciliter test guy before that first cycle, are you going to go back to 400 after? Most likely not. Maybe now it's 380. Yeah. Right now, whatever. Will the, will the HCG just, it, help prevent that? It can. It can. But again, HCG brings another level of more drugs there and also other side effects, right? HCG aromatizes on its own. So now you've, you have another estrogenic compound in there that you have to deal with. Um, I, I mean, I personally wouldn't use HCG unless you're very concerned about having a child that's, you know, or, or you're really concerned with your testicle size. I don't know any women that really care how big someone's testicles are though. Yeah. So not really. Well, what becomes interesting to me is it becomes this, it's like a game of cat and mouse. Right. So the testosterone, they go on that and then it's going to create that issue. So then they take the HCG, which is going to create that issue. Then and then before you know it, you know, there's there's 12 different things in there. Yep. You know, the testosterone is raising the blood pressure. So now you're going to put in bistolic or some kind of beta blocker. And then that's going to create other issues. And then you're starting to hold water. Then something that's going to come in. Yep. And then it just becomes this cycle. 
right? Is, is what, yeah, most guys are on 12 different things now yes. at a young age, right? Yes. And that's very different from when you and I were younger. Yes. It was, right? You did a cycle, did a cycle. You were on, te- or you just stayed on gear, right? Maybe you went on some blood pressure medicine if it was bad and mm-hmm. you actually cared. But like, you didn't see that. Now I see guys, you know, 28 or 29, they're on a list of pharmaceutical drugs. The funny one you never see though now, and you could probably eliminate most of the issues with it, is they're on TRT, right? And then they're on all these other things to control the sides you just need, yes. but they're not using an AI. And their estrogen's, you know, a 150. If they would just get their estrogen in range, they probably wouldn't have a high blood pressure. They wouldn't have the water retention. They wouldn't have all those other side effects if they actually just managed the rest of the cycle properly instead of throwing all the garbage at it. Well, that, that's what I think. I, I, I don't think it's what I see online is very rarely do you see, you know, the, the narrative or the conversations of just take test, right? It's always, here's this cycle, right? And it's, it's test primo or growth hormone and insulin, like that's the base. And then with that base, you, you may need the AI and all these other kind of, and that's where they will think they need to start. Right. And that's where a lot of people are, you know, this may be why you came online to start you know, mitigating a lot of this, because to me, you know, I look at something like that. It's like, you know, if you just would have just used the test by itself, it may have accomplished everything, everything. that's there. A, a guy said to me years ago, I probably either I was still natural or I had just started test and he's, he was, he was a, he was older than me, but he was a big dude and he had done a lot of gear. And he said to me, you know, I'm going to tell you this and you're going to do it anyway. He says, what everyone does, he goes, you're going to try every steroid in the world yeah. and you use huge amounts of it. And I'll tell you, you'll get to a point where you realize the test probably could have done everything all those drugs are doing, like 90% of it mm-hmm. without all the side effects. And you know what? Looking back, I'm like, wow, that was a smart guy. Yeah. It's not wrong. And now, again, it's not to say like in a prep situation or for a meet, sure. right? There's, there's, there's chemicals leveraged for different effects specifically. But that being said, for the average guy, like if you're talking about a cycle like that for like a lifestyle guy, so you need eight different things in there and insulin. Like, yeah, seems a little crazy. 300 milligrams a test, you know, or if he's 500 milligrams a test, a gram a test. I mean, you could make pretty damn good progress on a gram a test. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know? yeah. And it's to to kind of echo what that guy was saying the other thing that the majority of the people used to do may still do today is the dose is just going to keep going up until the dose is no longer until you start to see diminishing returns in your performance and how you look right so the sides really i mean back then whatever the sides were just part of the whole deal right so but now we we are better at being able to mitigate the sides which becomes another interesting conversation to me because if if i could go back and then mitigate the sides you see there's no way in hell i would have stayed on the same dose i certainly wouldn't have lowered the dose if i could mitigate the sides i can tell you exactly what i would have done <laughs> double the dose. <laughs> i would have doubled the dose yeah. until there were actually sides right yep. um but when those sides started to impact you know the training or the recovery then that was the pro- you know that was the problem like gyno whatever hair loss whatever i mean all these like fuck it i can live with that shit but not being able to recover between training sessions yeah you know, no, joint that's a big pain. deal i have the same haircut as you so yeah, yeah you know shit like split. that you know that was like ooh, wait a minute what if i pull back and then it starts going up again then it's like no wait a minute did i just actually lower my dose and then get stronger and then over a period of time it was not just lowering the dose but integrating other things in with it to make it synergistically work better and i think that's why we see the cycles that we see that are being you know promoted yeah. now right because that's something that kind of you end up at but i don't believe you should start at no i'm with you you know definitely shouldn't start there that conversation is not really happening no i mean i have it with my clients yeah this is you know i i have multiple guys that same thing these these very low TRT doses and they want to add something. You're not even on a cycle. Why would you add mm-hmm. things? 140 milligrams of testosterone is not a steroid cycle, right? So it's, why are we adding, th- play with the test first, mm-hmm. play with your food first. Why don't we fix the other things first before you just leverage drugs, right? I mean, yeah. that's the other thing, especially for physique looking stuff or, or physique based stuff. You got to fix the food. All the gear in the world is not going to solve the problem. Yeah. Um, I mean, you can, do a lot that might help around that but like you got to fix that stuff and your health is going to go down the toilet too if you're 
you know, if your food isn't correct and you're using a lot of drugs. But I agree that the initial it's, stuff It's should tricky though, right? Because if you're young enough, you can get away with a lot. You know, if you're in your 20s yeah. and you're just eating a lot of shit, more than likely you're going to probably cover your protein requirements and you're going to kind of get away with a lot. Yeah, and you can tolerate, you know, 1,000 grams of carbs and yeah. 100 grams of fat. and Yeah, and that, but even that, you're going to run into a wall, you know, where the advice I've always kind of put out there is if you start too soon and you haven't taken the time to, I don't want to say master, but at least figure out the diet, figure out the training figure out the recovery and then you start too soon those bases haven't been covered then your only answer when things start to is more gear and then more gear then more gear then it's going to come a certain point if you're in there long enough to where you realize the more gear doesn't work and i should probably focus on like how my training now 20 years into it 20 years yeah. into it so eventually you're still going to have to figure it out you just yeah but sometimes it's too late a, like at our age you're perfect. gonna go figure out how to squat now yes it, you, you know? it is it is too late well that's no i'm i, I don't yeah. think i think that is something that derek said i thought that was really wise i think he talked about when was the appropriate time to start a cycle and and i'm in full agreement i don't think it's about the age as far as maturity or brain mm -hmm. development or whatever i mean that's it's not wise to probably do steroids when you're 16 but whatever yeah i'm not that that's not my son so I, it's not my problem um i would say it's more all that stuff you figure out how to eat figure out how to train figure out all of those other things that actually matter more than the steroids before you introduce it because the drugs aren't going to help at a certain point, right? Like you said, initially it might make a big difference, but then you got to figure it out anyway. Yes. I mean, you see lots of guys on all sorts of stuff that look awful in gyms, right? They're not strong. They don't look good because they never focused on any mm -hmm. of that stuff. Well, like yeah. I was 39 until I started. I trained for almost 40 years natural and I learned my body. I didn't start till my body went the other direction. From what I've seen with those that start the anabolics too soon, assuming they're, they're staying in for two, three decades. Mm -hmm. If they start too soon, they're compromising the back end, right? And the back end is where you're going to have the longevity in the sport. You know, the back end is where you might get that pro card, or if you have the yep. pro card where you might actually win pro shows. That all happens, you know, a decade in, you know, for At most least. people. Yeah. You know, on the strength side, that's when, you know, the, the greatest strength when you're going to have the opportunity to compete at the greatest levels and be able to be healthy you know when you flip it and the people that waited longer they're able to optimize that back end because that back end now you're in your 30s i'm like i said i'm almost 50 and mm -hmm. i'm still getting you know to some degree i'm still getting stronger mm -hmm. i'm still getting bigger so because i waited right i know what my body yeah. can do and i think some of that and I'd like your opinion on this. Some of that is, is what we're talking about. You know, you're just developing the good habits first. Some of it, I think, is because you've been on gear for 25 years. There's going to be long-term impacts of being on for 20, 30 years, especially if you're actually blasting gear yeah. for that long. Would you say that that's the same? Yes. And I think, so one of the things that we're learning now is, so, so like blasting and cruising and by yeah. cruise, I mean a real cruise. A lot of the, a, a, lot, a lot of people aren't really cruising, right? A, or a cruise for them is a gram or two grams of gear. That's mm -hmm. not a real cruise. The, what, what occurs in simple terms, if you're not going back to like a TRT, like ideally you run a cycle. I don't know if it ever needs to be a predetermined length. Like, I don't know where that even came from. I would feel like if you plan a cycle basically based on a performance metric like you would be looking mm -hmm. at or a physique, as long as it's a reasonable goal, right? You're not going to add a hundred pounds to your squat, mm -hmm. at a certain point. you're not going to add 50 pounds of muscle in a cycle, but like it's, it's a reasonable goal. You run it until you accomplish that goal, right? And then you should back off to something like TRT because what happens is during that, that elevated androgen level, all the stem cells in your body are getting pulled into muscle tissue to help them yeah, grow yeah. there. It's not going to your organs. So your liver, your kidneys, your lungs, your heart are not getting the support from your body that they need because you've given your body this very strong signal that it needs to go to muscle. Mm -hmm. So if you were to stay on a huge amount of androgens for never mind years, decades, yeah, that's when you see organ damage, things start to grow, you know, so it's it's probably a wise idea for most guys to come back. And the other thing is, like you said, if you if you were to sort of gram a test all the time, that's it becomes homeostasis. Your body's yeah. like this gram is now normal, right? You're not going to get anything out of it at a certain point. So it's what do you do? You got to go up. 
but you can only go up to a certain point before things fail. Yeah, yeah. So it's like, if you can, if you can reset, re, uh, I used to reset Lucy, cause we're not actually resetting. And, yeah. If you can bring the level down and, you know, and cruise for a period of time and then hit even the thousand again, you'll probably get new progress out of that same dose again, because it's a new stimulus. So if you bring that level down, I mean, how far does that need to go down? Granted, there's there's blood work metrics, so I'll let you kind of go into that. But how far does that need to come down? Because you would think that the most optimal would be to, to be off. Right? Well, the problem when you come off, especially you've been on for a long time, is you can now crash, mm -hmm. right? So then you're also putting your body in a very vulnerable situation with no anabolic support at yeah. all, right? So then, right, I mean... Um, being hypogonadal, you know, Alzheimer's, osteoporosis, uh, all sorts of health issues come from having super low testosterone. So I wouldn't personally put my body in that situation because there's no necessarily benefit of coming off, right? It's not. Yeah. So the whole theory, I don't even know why this still exists because this is proven in the 80s. Androgen receptors can't get dirty or clogged. That's not a thing. That's the way an androgen <laughs> receptor works. They actually upregulate in the presence of androgens, and that's been proven for 40 years. Um, so there, it's not like you need to come off to like get more androgen receptors. Actually, the higher level of androgens, you'll keep making more receptors. The body doesn't like hormones floating in the blood. It's going to create things to, mm -hmm. to basically bind to them. Um, as far as a level. So scientifically, we know that 1400 nanograms per deciliter as an average, uh, like daily average, not like a peak there and then a drop yeah. uh, there or above is the amount of testosterone needed in the blood to grow muscle without other things going on. So you could clearly, right? Natural people grow muscle, you know, yeah. every day of the week. So it's not to say that you would have to have testosterone over that, but if you were just going to leverage androgens for growth, like, and that's what Basin was showing. He, he showed, you know, 50 milligrams, 75 milligrams, hundred, you know, 150, 300 and 600 milligrams. And basically three and 600 were the only two that caused any muscle growth. It's because the average nanogram per deciliter was over that amount mm -hmm. and they weren't exercising. That's a whole nother, that yeah. doesn't mean don't exercise and take drugs, but, um, no, but I will come back to that. But that, it, um, yeah. but basically, so you would want to cut in theory, at least if this, some of the stuff is new in theory, you would want to at least get your average daily amount under 1400 nanograms, right? Because you're not trying to drive anabolism at that point. You're just trying to hold your health, mm -hmm. right? When that testosterone level is above that, you're basically sending the stem cells just to, you know, muscles. Okay. So it's that study that you quoted, I've had several people mm -hmm. actually throw that study out, you know, in regards to anabolics. And it's, it's kind of a fucked up thing because in the context that it's thrown out sometimes is, look, you can just take the stuff and not even train and still grow. And then it's based upon this one study, you yeah. know, with- It's 96. It was dose dependent response to testosterone levels. So he, in fact, he is such a big impact on the endocrine world that they actually named, so the error that we're in now is considered the post-Basin error when it comes to endocrinology, because before him, and you mentioned this mm -hmm. before, in the early 90s and way before, doctors, most doctors didn't understand testosterone at all, and they didn't think it caused muscle growth. Yeah, They had no idea. So like if you went to your general practitioner, unless he was very in on stuff in the 80s, He'd be like, testosterone doesn't do anything for muscles. It says right there on the box, yeah. Anadrol 50, that he can't be used for performance. Mm -hmm. Uh, it only causes priapism. Um, so he basically was, he set out to show that, look, even with no other stimulus, look at that. It works. I mean, obviously the doctors that believe the opposite of that never saw pumping iron or mm -hmm. never went to Gold's Gym. Well, yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean, I mean it's it was, pretty dumb. I lived that. through that time period. And it's like, so, you're, this is dumb as fuck. Like I, yeah. I phys you yeah. physically see it. Yeah. And so, um, the thing is what the, so the group was like 18 to 35 and they were, they had not used anabolics previously, right? So they were all very new to this stuff and they, um, they were not training. Their, their, their calorie intake was standardized though. So it was based on their own recording of it though. So it, fairly accurate, but not like they're in a lab where they're feeding them. And they were told not to do any exercise outside of walking. So you take someone who's never used steroids before and you give them 600 milligrams of test. Will they grow muscle? Yeah, probably a little bit. I, I, a lot, of, a lot of that gains were probably other right. Lean body mass is not just muscle; it consists of glycogen yeah, and this yeah, other, yeah. you know, tendon matter mass and all sorts of other stuff. So, did it work? Sure. Is that what people should do? No. Why would you take? <laughs> why would you waste six hundred milligrams of testosterone and sit on the couch? Yeah. 
his point was more that testosterone is anabolic in a dose response relationship. And that's what we see these guys with these silly amounts of tests. You're like, it's not going to do anything. Yes. It's been proven not to work at that amount. Yes. And sexual function is held at the lower amount, which was also proven. And, and we, that makes sense from a morphology point of view, like how humans developed. Right. So unfortunately our, the main function of men on this planet is right. You're supposed to hunt. You're probably supposed to protect yeah. and you're supposed to breed. Yeah. Well, if you can't do those things, you're going to get clubbed over the head by a younger guy and, and you're done with. So breeding was the most important, right? The goal for any animal is to carry on their species. So sexual functions actually maintained at a very low level of testosterone. So clinically, when you see a guy come in and you know, even if you testosterone is, and it depends on the person, testosterone is in the three hundreds and they still can, you know, perform that way. That's not surprising because it, if, if they're coming in for sexual dysfunction, looking for testosterone, their testosterone has to be really low at that point. Mm -hmm. you know, and I'm talking about, again, a natural person. If, if you're coming off a gram of gear and you go down to 200, it doesn't mean that you're going to be a porn star. Yeah, it's, yeah. it's all relative. Um, but that's... So yeah. how, how would no, one know if we're staying with the testosterone of when to titrate up the doves? I mean, with, so you could probably apply this to strength athletes as well. With physique guys, generally, I would say that the standard rule that I would apply is if the scale's not moving, and I don't mean a, a pound, of, like realistically, mm -hmm. if you're gaining 10 to 12 pounds of muscle a year, that's a ton of muscle. Like you're not gaining a pound of muscle a week. No. That's fluid or fat. If, if the scale's not moving, it's generally food, right? Physics. You can't create matter from, no, from, from nothing. So you need more energy to go in. Right. So that's what I'll generally push. If the composition starts to go, like their body fat starts to creep up, right? They don't look as hard. You know, the strength is plateauing, some neurological stuff. Like maybe that's the time then to titrate the cycle up. But I wouldn't just arbitrarily throw more gear at a problem. Yeah. Because as you've probably realized in the past, either with yourself or with other people, the more you use and the faster you get there, the more you're going to need down the road. Yes. Right. This is the other thing I try to teach young guys is that if you can grow on 300 milligrams, don't just add five because the next cycle is not going to be three again. <laughs> now it's going to be six yeah, yeah. and then it's a gram. And then you're going to be 29 years old and using three grams a gear. And unless you're competing in bodybuilding or in, or in something that actually matters where you can, the drugs actually aid you in your career. What are you using that much gear at that age? Yeah. Well, I'm, I'm asking from the standpoint of, you know, as a strength athlete, that that titration is going to be based upon your recovery. Mm -hmm. You know, are you recovering from one heavy session to yep. the next heavy session? And is is this happening more than just one time? Yeah. You know, so over yeah, a period of three weeks. Right? Yeah, you just only, right. Uh, where with physique sports, that metric isn't as prevalent, you know, because the training is being regulated. You yep. know, it, and you you don't really know if you're stronger or not stronger, nor do you really give a fuck no. because it's not really the main metric yeah. that you're trying to drive so if that's where that question kind of comes from because if if there is that that metric to be able to drive then it's just going to be randomized you know there's just yeah. at this point and we have seen those stupid recommendations like that at 12 weeks out you start here then at eight weeks and yeah. six weeks and four weeks and like where the fuck does that come from like where I you know, know. As, as, as a strength athlete as long as you're recovering and you're making progress you're cool yeah just sit back because you you you, you will need it it will need to go up at some point yeah but you don't like, necessarily need to just force it up no same with the physique athlete you don't yeah. just force it up for no reason well if you pull it up too soon then you're going to have problems at the end if yeah. it's peaking. Or you look or, worse. Sometimes mm -hmm. guys look worse than they use too many drugs. I mean, I would say for recovery point of view, like from a, for a strength athlete, it, then you maybe it's other compounds with it that actually aid in yeah. better nitrogen retention rate. Maybe it's a nandrolone. Maybe it's, you know, Anavar. Maybe it's something else that helps, you know, technically any of them, but Trembolone, any of them, depending on what your goal is or what you tolerate or what your preference is. But like, that's probably where the strength guys go, right? That's why they'll add, you know, Anadrol in or something. Mm -hmm. Right. Or super draw or T ball. I don't know what the strength guys use nowadays. Well, it's, it's interesting when you're dealing with orals because that's, that's kind of moving in two different camps. You know, the one camp would be kind of like be old school. You'll just introduce those in Before, as the meat gets yeah. closer. You know, I used to say as the meat would come around, you lower the jabs and you up the tabs because yep. what's the point that's of true. like blasting shit injectable two weeks before? I mean, it's, it's like a week before is almost fucking stupid. Yeah, yeah. You know, let's, 
you're concerned about recovering after the meet. And I, God, I'm going to go on a rant. I've seen so many people, you know, just take tons of sh injectable shit a week before that end up with fucking scar tissue and knots that they're not able to squat right. I got a hematoma once for doing it. Stupid. I mean, it's like, the, it's not going to do shit the last week where the orals will. Right. Cause yeah. you know, it's way fast. Yeah. So there still is that camp, but this other camp that's coming around, which is really interesting is you'll take, let's say the Anadrol either the night before the neighbor, the day before that heavy squat day, then the morning of that squat day, and then maybe a couple hours before. So maybe three tabs, mm -hmm. or whatever it's going to be. And it's all based around basically the neural aspect, you know, mm -hmm. being able to create it's non -genomic. Anadrol is all non-genomic. Yeah. Then doom, it's all, and it's evolving more around the, whatever lift that they're trying to develop the most like the weakest okay. lift the lift they're trying to bring up because if it was every lift then they would be on every day right because okay. there's you know a day between each one to where i've experimented with things like that and i do notice that there's a difference you know it, not really that much between hallow or anadrol it's kind of mm -hmm. here nor there they're about the same, about the same thing um, one's angrier than the other yes but it but right before it's not it's not simulated, so it's probably not soon enough. Yeah, you know. Whereas the morning before, or whatever. So those two camps are. It's, it's interesting to me because uh, from the principle of you know, say the explosive strength, and maybe it's all mental. You know, I'll let you expand. What you know more. Yeah. You know, and uh, but you know, are you lifting weights that you're? It's beyond your capacity. You know, which then could become detrimental at a later point in time. You, you get what I'm saying? So if it, yeah. now, now your tempers are five percent over what you could normally do if that wasn't in there. Then I guess it could be an overload type of metric, but that over a long period of time can lead to injury. You know, which is. And so, what are your thoughts on those two approaches? If it is a strength athlete, I, um, I off the top of my head, I would almost lean more toward a bigger bolus. So like if you're using 150 Anadrol, which is, I'm guessing mm -hmm. is what you referred mm -hmm. to as Anadrol mm -hmm. three times, I would almost do like 150 the night before. Now bear with me. I'm not mm -hmm. a strength mm -hmm. athlete, so mm -hmm. I'm just, I'm flying off the cuff here. Yeah. I would almost do like 150 the night before because the, with the bigger single dose, you get a much higher blood level, okay. right? And it'll peak. The Granted, the half-life, but the half-life of Anadrol is still nine hours. So mm -hmm. it's not like it's tapered off. Right. And assuming that wasn't the only time you took Anadrol, some of it's built up in serum as well. Right. So versus, you know, spacing it out, which I get as well, but you're not getting as much of a response. Mm -hmm. Right. Like if you took 40 milligrams of Halo at once, which I don't recommend, versus <laughs> if you took 10 milligrams spaced throughout the day, you might have more even strength, but you'd probably get a bigger burst, I would guess, from that immediate non genomic response from the bigger dose at once. Mm -hmm. Right. Like injecting test suspension. Right, because yeah, you got yeah. big mm -hmm. bolus. I mean, that's kind of the way that I would think to leverage it. But again, that's not my forte. So I, yeah, well, know. when I was competing, that was the when the jabs went down, the suspension would come in. Yeah, makes you know, sense because you feel it immediately. Faster, yeah, yeah, except it burnt like a motherfucker. Oh, yeah, you know, so there's yeah. there's those other side, you know, other aspects of all that as well. But if if you were to compare that to just the last four or five weeks taken Anadrol, or mm -hmm. the Hallow is probably too harsh for. I don't know. Bodybuilding? Uh, you know, for, for the powerlifting or the strength athlete, you know, it's because one, in one camp, that may be the way that they're going to use it, say, for an eight week period of time. And the other camp, they would just take it every day for a month. I mean, we're kind of comparing apples and apples in a way. Yeah. And again, you're, you're, you're probably talking about elite level athletes mm -hmm. too that. From the numbers that I've seen, it looks like the guys that are like in your guys that are truly gifted at that stuff. Like if you look at the difference between the really gifted guys when they're not on stuff and when they're on stuff, the numbers aren't that different. Yeah. Right. Like yeah. you're a strong dude no matter what yeah. you do. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. Like I'm much stronger on gear because I'm not naturally a strong person. Mm -hmm. Um so oh, I don't know, I don't know how much of a difference it would actually mm -hmm. make for you with the dosing protocol there. Yeah. Right. Like I think some of it might be in your head. Halo definitely gets in your head. Halo's like I wouldn't stay on Halo for five weeks personally yeah, either. Yeah, like yeah. maybe it's two to three weeks at the most. All right. So what if it was I just straight hypertrophy based? You'd be better off taking something for a longer period of time, right? Yeah. It takes time for tissue to accrue. Mm -hmm. And Anadrol itself for like bodybuilding, you usually we would mix it with something else because it magnifies that and D-ball kind of magnify things that really deal with the AR. So the, the most common one, 
or I would say the, the most efficient one would be like Trembolone and Anadrol. They magnify, they're synergistic. So it's not one plus one is two. It's like one time, one plus one yeah. is three with the two of those versus like stacking milligrams. Like if you take Tran and EQ and test, you're really just adding milligrams there at a certain point. It's not, you're not getting a synergistic effect yeah. versus Anadrol adds some synergy to that, which will magnify like fi- that, these are just, there's not dose recommendations. These are just numbers. Yes. If you took 50 milligrams of Anadrol and 50 milligrams of Tran acetate, you'd get a much stronger result than if you took a hundred milligrams of either of those separately. Yes. That makes sense. No, that makes sense. That you know, that makes sense. And I think that also applies into the strength sports. Yeah. And that that's the biggest change that I've seen since, you know, I first started taking shit 30 years ago. We, we didn't know. Right. No one knew. At you that were that following point, what the guy in the gym told you. Yeah. And it was all milligrams. You know, so it didn't, to me, it didn't matter if it, I've told this several times before that, you know, it's parabolin, you know, it's 76 milligrams per ampule and it's was 18 bucks or whatever it's going to be. Stenox is like $5 mm-hmm. for 200 milligrams. Granted, they're two completely different compounds. One's way better you're than just the look, other. Looking at the number. I'm just looking at the number. It's like, fuck that. I can buy three of these for the same price of this. And yeah. that's kind of what that mindset was. You know, it wasn't until later down the road that you start looking at how these are synergistically. Yeah, they're not all the same. Yeah, because one will stack milligrams. The other will stack synergistically. synergistically. Right? Yeah, which is rare. It's really just D-ball and Anadrol. Tremblone seems to be the best one to add to those, but... Yeah. You know. So when you're looking at that synergy, what are the different pillars that you're going to look to combine from? Well, so the D ball and Anadrol really have no interaction with the classic androgen receptor. So this three, mm-hmm. this, uh, as the, we know of now, there's three basic places where there's an androgen receptor in a cell. So you have the classic one that is bound to a heat shock protein and it's in the cytoplasm. And when an androgen is close by, it will translocate, release from the heat shock protein, grab the androgen and go to the nucleus. And that's protein synthesis. That's what we want. Mm -hmm. At least from a a hypertrophy point of view, that's the effect you're looking for. You also have a one that's called subcellular that we're really not sure what it does. That only, the only two drugs that I'm aware of that interact with that are Stanazole, Winstrol Mm -hmm. and Danazole, which no one in the right mind has taken Danazole because it's like just a, it's, it's a useless bodybuilding drug. Um, but we don't know exactly what that's doing. It doesn't seem to go in the nucleus. It doesn't seem to go to the cell surface. Um, it's clear it does something. Winstrol definitely works. We just don't know what that gene response is. And then you have the non-genomic one, which is on the cell surface all the time. And that one doesn't come in. And that's, that's what powerlifters are more looking for. So that's not doing protein synthesis. That's that immediate thing. Mm-hmm. That's aggression. That's strength. And there is strength, obviously, from the classic one as well, because the more muscle you have, in theory, at least, yeah. you're going to get stronger, right? You're yeah. you're stronger 300 pounds than you are at 250. Yeah, I, I would agree with that 100%. I think the, where, where the variance comes is how much glycogen is that muscle holding. Yeah, exactly. Right? So that's that would be the difference. When between, panation angle and all those yeah. other things apply. Like, you're strong because your body was designed with certain leverages that I might not have, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So... Um, it's so anadrol and D ball don't, they really just interact with that cell surface one and cause non-genomic response. There's clearly more to the story, but we just don't understand the, you know, the kinetics of the drug fully and probably never will. Mm -hmm. Um, because it clearly is causing muscle growth. If you take anadrol on its own, you're going to grow. Right. But yet it's not going into the nucleus. So, yeah, but, and Tremblone has an incredible affinity for the androgen receptor. So that's why they're working very well together because they're doing totally opposite things. Versus like testosterone, you know, it's 31 by 31% binding affinity to the androgen receptor. So yeah, it's binding to the androgen receptor, but not that firmly. Mm-hmm. Uh, lots of things can push it out of the way. EQ is 47, I think. So EQ will push test out of the way. Trend will definitely push test out of the way. So it's, to me, it's leveraging. It's figuring out what compound is going to be, have the most affinity for the AR and what ones don't. And it's just those, those. So compounds. when you say push it out of the way, does that mean that it's essentially useless to combine those two? No, but you, if you have, so everyone has a saturation point, mm-hmm. we don't know what that is. So it's been estimated that the average American male has a saturation point of, let's say 3,500 milligrams at any given minute, right? Cause compounds are, your testosterone is constantly binding and then re- releasing. Yeah. Uh, they have both an affinity and efficacy. So different drugs will hold on for longer. You know, others will come off quicker. Uh, if you're, if you're near your saturation point, which goes up again with the androgen receptor. So as you do more drugs and lift more weights, lifting weights also increases androgen receptor density. If you lift a ton of weights and you take a ton of drugs, you can have a lot more androgen receptors. Ronnie Coleman can clearly tolerate more steroids than 
some natural kid in high school. Yeah. And he was born, he was probably born with a higher density anyway. And he's just magnified that over time. Um, if you're near your saturation point, like if you, if you, if you've been using gear for a long time and he took, you know, 300 milligrams of tests and 200 milligrams of EQ. No, it's not going to be an issue because you're not anywhere near saturation. Mm -hmm. But if you were to take three grams of test and three grams of EQ and you were fully saturated at 5,000 and now you're at 6,000, well, the problem is EQ will bind and stay there longer, right? And tests can't really go there. So now tests will only go to the cell surface receptor and cause side effects. So, so then, and this is why, especially with 19 NORs, you see this a lot, Tremblone, Nandrolone, they have a stronger binding affinity to the androgen receptor testosterone. So if, if you've ever taken a, a ton of trend, if you took a gram of trend and two grams of test, I'm just, yeah, 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 you'll yeah, notice yeah. you just get side effects yeah. because the testosterone really can't it's, do that much. Yeah. What is it doing at that point? It's just now it's, it's there to, it does serve a purpose, right? It's there to aromatize. You need estrogen, you need yeah. some DHT, you need these other things, but it's not most likely the trend is fully bound, you know, to the AR and, and it's doing all the, an the anabolic work. The test at that point is not, that's why the classic stuff in the, you know, when you were younger, when I was younger, right. The classic stuff, at least for bodybuilding in the late seventies and early eighties, it was, it was Deca. It was Primo. And then they would use just a little bit of D ball for estrogen. They probably didn't even know why they were using it. They just noticed they felt better with a little D-ball, right? 20 milligrams of D-ball, and they would pull the D-ball out before a show to dry out. And they would might drop the deck of two or three weeks out, so to dry out a mm -hmm. little more from it. But like, they knew that when you added more tests and all of a sudden they got really bad side effects. It wasn't until like the yeah. mid 80s when everything changed, right? Power Brown came on the scene or you could actually get the French acetate that was still injectable back then. And the drug protocol totally changed then, right? And then over time, now all the guys are using tons of tests, which there's nothing wrong with again, but you just have to be careful about what you're leveraging with it, mm -hmm. right? So that's why nowadays, most of the guys, it's, it's more like test and primo, you know, test and master on those kind of things because they play nice together. Yeah, so when you put those other the the primo and the or the master on in there, the test actually is should come down. Oh, what depends? Well, primo will crush your estrogen yeah, yeah, if you yeah. run it too high. At least in my experience, mm -hmm. master on doesn't seem to do that. It kind of gives you that look. Yeah, um, I don't know if strength guys even use master on. I know it makes yeah. you stronger. Yeah, seems too dry. Yeah, I mean the, the base is still test test because yeah, you want to be wet and strong yeah, and try yeah makes sense <clears throat> um no i mean you can get easily do like a one-to-one -one on test and primo or test and master on mm -hmm. not many guys can run primo much higher than test without having really crushed estrogen unless you're a very high aromatizer so when we go to throw in growth hormone you know on top of all that what is that doing well it's a totally different class of drugs so it's yeah it's not interacting with them on an immediate point, it's not directing, it's not interacting directly with them in an immediate stance. It's you know, back end like IGF. So things like Tremblone will actually magnify the IGF response inside the muscle from the growth hormone. Um, Winstrol does that as well, frees up. Winstrol reduces binding proteins for IGF. So it'll magnify IGF. So they, they work together and they mm -hmm. help build, right? And, and GH, if high enough, if the dose is high enough, which we don't know, I can get into that in a second. We don't really know once you've added steroids because too many variables there, what the dose is to increase muscle growth. Um, but you've, you've just, now you have more cells from the GH, right? And then the, and then the anabolics can work better because now they have more raw material to work with um, to grow muscle. All right. So when that's implemented, because you, you mentioned the, no, the dose thing, right? So <laughs> again, there's two camps on that, right? So there's the one camp, like before I used keep it right there. Then there's the other camp, just take whatever you can afford. Well, it depends what the, are you, yeah. from a strength athlete point of view? No, from a, well, hypertrophy, because a strength athlete, I'm going to say it's not as going to be as important. I was going to say that you probably just need a minimal just to keep your joints good, yeah, right? Yeah, if, if that. Even if you're going to use it, it probably mm -hmm. seems like an expensive waste unless mm -hmm. you're injured. Uh, for bodybuilding, no, the more, I don't like absolute statements. Yeah. Uh, generally, the more you can afford and tolerate, clearly, right? Yeah. Not everyone can tolerate huge amounts of growth hormone is going to work better. So the dose medically, again, this is just with just growth hormone. This is not anabolics added in, but mm -hmm. the dose needed to require actual permanent tissue growth. So they've looked at all different dosing strategies 
and what and what occurred, and then with a washout period to then measure the cells again and see if the tissue stayed. And they notice with the lower doses, you get as soon as you inject growth hormone, your nitrogen retention goes up. You have double nitrogen retention in a week from growth hormone. Does that mean you're growing tissue? Not yet. Right? It takes time to build this mm -hmm. tissue. And with the lower doses, the t you actually were getting new cell mass. It just doesn't stay. After six months, it was gone. You were back to baseline again. And that's where the dosing for HIV came from. So if the actual formula, again, this is just growth hormone only without anabolics, to grow actual tissue that will stay was 0.1 milligrams per kilogram. So you could do the math. For me, that's like 12, mm -hmm. like 200 pounds. That's like 12 milligrams of growth hormone a day. That's two bottles of serotonin a day. Yeah. Now, the reason why HIV gets six is because if you actually look at the charts, most people, unfortunately, with HIV weigh about 140 pounds. Mm. There's also just like anabolics, there's, there's a like a dose response curve, right? So like with Anadrol, Anadrol is a perfect example. A lot of steroids like testosterone continue to produce more results the more you take, right? Up to a point, it yeah. kind of tuckers out a little bit probably. But like Anadrol has a pretty sharp cutoff. A lot of people ignore that and they just continue to swallow as many androls as they can. But like after about 150, it really seems to just kind of be a side effect thing and a liver issue and mm -hmm. all sorts of other things. You know, I'm sure there's been tons of great bodybuilders, especially in the 90s, that built massive physiques eating 300 milligrams of anadrol, but I don't know what it's really doing at that point. Again, the data is not looking at guys that are that big, yeah. but it does seem, but my point with growth is there probably is a dose response curve there as well. So it's possible that over six milligrams, you're not getting linear growth. But my point is for growth from growth hormone, you, you need a bigger dose. Now, with the different times that you can take that, because that becomes another talking point, you know, it's you know, pre-workout, post-workout, morning when you get up, pre-cardio or before bed, right? So medically, it's only used at night. Most of the work that GH is doing is through IGF, right? So there's a sharp cutoff. And this is where the multi-dosing thing came from. There's mm -hmm. a sharp cutoff at GH at like one, again, average person. We don't know in athletes. 1.7 milligrams uh, is basically where, uh, 1.7 uh, units, basically, so way less than a milligram, is basically where GH cuts out its effects and the rest, anything on top of that is just from IGF. Um, but there's a couple issues. When you inject growth hormone, it takes like four to five hours to reach peak in serum. So if you're injecting it in the morning, looking to do faster cardio, unless you're waiting five hours to do cardio, it's not there. The, if you do it at night before you go to bed, it is there. So I would say if your concern is for fat loss in the morning, doing it at night makes a whole lot more sense than doing it mm -hmm. during the day. The other thing is growth hormone is pulsatile. It was, your body's designed like that. And I understand what people are trying to mimic that by pulsing it throughout the day. The problem is you have lag time and you're keeping it f elevated too high. You don't necessarily want your growth hormone super elevated all day long. That's not the way the body works. You can become diabetic by doing that because your body can't use glucose efficiently when you do that. So one of the, one of the many reasons why in children, AIDS, all the diseases that it's used for, it's given at night before bed, is you have a higher natural insulin response for, like once you fall asleep. So it's kind of clearing out some of that extra glucose that's floating around. You're not lethargic. I don't know if you've ever taken a big amount of growth hormone, you can't stay awake. So it, it actually helps you sleep. And you're also only getting one gigantic pulse by the next day, by 3 p.m., your pituitary is back online producing its small little burst of growth hormone and your body's totally fine, right? Because there are times that growth hormone will come out naturally and there's times that they won't, right? Like as soon as you've eaten, growth hormone's not supposed to be elevated. That's the opposite, mm -hmm. right? Your body only breathes growth hormone in times of stress or lack of food. Yeah. It's not supposed to be super high. And that's, again, I, I won't do, do a whole video on that. On, um, Negla, the, that long acting stuff. I told a bunch of guys that that's total junk for bodybuilding. I don't know why anyone in the right mind would use that. So first of all, it does the same thing. Yeah. Why would you want a long, steady hold on growth hormone for a week? Mm -hmm. Like it mimics placental growth hormone secretion. So it says specifically on the box for children under 12. It's not, it was never designed for adults. It's not, and it's not, it's not somatropin either. It's somatrogen. It's a different chemical. It has 38 amino acids from HCG attached to it to prolong the life. But the problem is once you've changed even one amino acid, it's a totally different chemical. Mm -hmm. And what in utero, 
you don't want the baby exposed to tons of IGF-1 because you'll get all sorts of other growth that you're not looking for. You're looking for long bone growth from that. And that's what IGF-2 does. And that's all that the somatrogen is going to cause production of is IGF-2. So bodybuilders, of course, like you said before, will abuse anything they think will help them. So they're buying this stuff that's falling off a truck and using it. And it's not going to do anything. Mm -hmm. What would be the benefit of taking growth hormone pre-training? Because I'm not, because when it rises. Not necessarily. It's rising after anyway, which again, yeah. after you, so if you just squat, right, your growth hormone level goes up yeah. after. You yeah. might be, depending on how long you're lifting or when you took it, you might be getting some rise. It doesn't mean you can't split up your dose. I'm just saying, yeah. if I had to pick one time to use it, it would be at night before bed. Okay. Uh, and I would say the dose, if you're looking for hypertrophy, it seems that like, so the, the five I use, again, we medically, you measure growth hormone in milligrams. No one talks about it in units because that's for insulin. Yeah. Like yeah, that's yeah, yeah. only, only athletes talk about it in units. Um, so a three I use should equal one milligram. That's pretty standard mm -hmm. if you're diluting it correctly. It's th that kind of mimics what you were when you were a teenager. So you're not going to get like phenomenal look from that. It seems when you get above three milligrams, you know, which is like nine units you know, and so on is where, I don't know what your experience is, but I noticed a much bigger difference when I went somewhere between nine and 18 units, three and six milligrams. Yeah. It's like kind of where the growth mm -hmm. is and it's very fast. Mm -hmm. um, and it does seem permanent. You don't hold the bubbly size from it when you lower it because that's just fluid, but you definitely, the, the growth from it stays. Yeah, the, the issue I always had when it would go up there is my hands being numb. Yep. Right. So, and it, there was nothing I could do to really be so on potassium. That. Yeah. So a lot of that is sodium retention at the kidneys. Right. And then you, and then to, to magnify that response, every athlete now wants to drink salt water for some reason. So you're now creating this like hyper sodium situation in the body and your kidneys are not excreting it at a faster rate with the growth hormone. Mm -hmm. So it, and that sodium will cause it's so, like if you ate Chinese food and you haven't eaten in a while, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, yeah. That's what the growth that, hormone is doing. It it's is. sodium, yeah, yeah. So it's compressing the the medial nerve here. Mm -hmm. if, a lot of times, if you just increase your potassium intake, it'll get rid of most of that. Uh, that would have been nice to know. So years the ratio yeah. is, uh, I mean, they even think our ancestors was a sixteen to one potassium to sodium ratio. Really? Where were they getting sodium from? the blood in animals yeah, is basically yeah, yeah, what you're getting yeah. from. So this whole new kick on bringing your sodium way mm -hmm. high, I, I'm not anti, you need sodium to live. Clearly. Yeah, yeah, but yeah. that being said, what, what is the point of bringing your sodium super high? Sodium's not going into the cell. It's coming out of the cell. Mm -hmm. Potassium goes in. Yeah. I need to use the restroom real quick, but when I come back, I want to get into insulin. Sure. And then how that kind of came. Yeah, I'll, I'll go yeah. after you. I'm Craig um, from Rigby, Idaho. Been following Elite FTS for at very least six, seven years. This event, I, PR'd my bench by 100 pounds. I actually got to try gear for the very first time ever. I got a, over 150, almost 150 pound carry over with gear for the very first time. It was just amazing. You're never gonna get that experience anywhere else. I mean, nobody has a whole rack full of extra gear to be able to try. It's just unbelievable. I joined the Discord server just because of all the information that's out there. Um, all the different form checks, all the ebooks. There's even giveaways on it. They give away different blemish bars and the knowledge. I mean, I, I'm never around anybody that really likes to talk training for hours and hours and hours on end. This event is absolutely chock full of people that do want to do nothing but talk training. It is the most amazing event I've ever been to. Okay. <clears throat> So we're going to get an insulin. Now this, mm. this, this is, this is a fun one, right? Because this is how this was all presented to me years ago is insulin is the most anabolic drug. So you need to be taking that. But the problem with insulin is it's going to make you fat. So if insulin is <laughs> going to make you fat, then you have to have thyroid to be able to take, you know, with that to combat that making you fat. But the thyroid is going to tank your growth hormone. So you got to have the growth hormone in there to be able to combat that aspect. And then the growth hormone is going to have its impact on testosterone. So you need to basically one thing was to counter the other thing. But the 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 main wheel and the whole hub was the insulin and the insulin had to be able to drive that. But and then the, the growth hormone will tank insulin. So yeah, the insulin, like, you know, yeah. it just keeps kind of going yeah, around. So you need more wheel. of everything. So you need more of everything. But from a broad view looking into that there's there's a lot of synergy that's happening amongst yeah. all those so with the advent and i don't know how long insulin's been used as a ped right so in 1980 i think so wow well so uh, tom 
Bell, Bell Camp. Bell. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he was di- type one diabetic. Okay, and he noticed that when he took more insulin post workout, that he got bigger. He was like, "Wow." Now, I don't think it got popular at that point. It was still very hard to find. Right, mm-hmm. it wasn't like as readily available as it is now. Milos basically, you know, yeah. spread this. Well, I remember it was a, probably in the when 80s. it first started to come in, it was post workout. Yeah, for sure. And it was mid eighties, right? Eighty five, yeah. eighty six, somewhere around there. And then somewhere it started to deviate to pre workout. You know, with intra. And, when that, and that was kind of another one of those hamster wheels where, you know, when all the interest started to come out, you know, and it's like, it was the way it was presented to me is, you know, the, the amount of carbs is going to be based upon the amount of insulin that you're taking. Backwards. You know, and, and so then you, I would wonder like, if, well, if you're not taking insulin, is any of this shit even going to help that much? But intra workout carbs yeah, definitely help. Well, I don't it, use insulin. It, it definitely yeah, helps. It de- definitely, it, it helps. But the, the dose, you know, would depend upon, but you said that's, that's not backwards. true. What yeah. you, I would, it should be used the same way as a diabetic would use it, right? So your, your dose of insulin is based on what you just ate. Mm-hmm. Like a diabetic doesn't, a diabetic doesn't go and inject X amount of insulin and then go try to eat that amount of food. That yeah. doesn't make a lot of sense to me. That's what, but that's what bodybuilders are doing. Yes. What, so that doesn't make any sense to me because it's based on your, your glucose response. Well, that was confusing to me, which is why I'm putting it it's out backwards. there. Yeah. I mean- Unless you're very particular and you know exactly what you're doing, but like uh, from my experience, most guys aren't that particular. Yeah. They make mistakes. I did see with that weird backwards dosing, I took my kids to get ice cream the other night and there was a little girl, six or seven years old, sitting on a bench next to me eating her ice cream. And she was about to throw it out and her dad stopped her and he said, honey, you took, you took a, you know, whatever amount of insulin mm. already, you have to finish that ice cream. And I thought to myself, I was like... I would love to say something because that's pretty shitty parenting and it's not a drug use, like this weird way to, to do with your kids. Like, yeah. Yeah. Like before they go out, he just gave her an amount of insulin and it's like, now we have to catch up with the food. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But like that's, to, that, that doesn't make any sense to me. Um, so what would be the optimal way for it to be used as a PED? Post. Mm-hmm. I mean, the pre thing, it just, the guys are going hypo in the gym. Yeah. Why? Well, I'm hypo. How are you? Yeah. Lifting? Well, I've seen, <clears throat> long acting insulin being taken in the morning and then very short, like a hemolog, mm-hmm. you know, with each meal and then pre and post, you know, so I've seen protocols with all of that. And then I've also seen protocols just post. I mean, that would probably be the safer. I adding Lantus, like that's what you're talking about long. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It, it seems to become a little crazy again. I like the elite level. Like I say this, on other podcasts about bodybuilding on the elite level, I think if you're eating enough food to justify it and you're at that level of muscularity where it it will actually make a difference and sure, whatever, Mm -hmm. use it at that point, you should also know how to use it. That shouldn't be like you're referring to something (laughs) online to figure out how to use insulin. Yeah. Um, or at least have a coach that understands that stuff. Um, where I see it go wrong is that these guys that are eating 200 grams of carbs that think they need to leverage insulin, like it's going to be this wildly anabolic thing, mm-hmm. right? So that that term isn't wrong that it's the most anabolic hormone in the human body, but it's 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 not it's not clear as to why they're finding anabolism. Anabolism is the building of any tissue, so it doesn't right as catabolism is the breakdown. It mm-hmm. doesn't mean it's the most muscle building compound in the human body. IGF one would technically be the most anabolic hormone in the human body. Um, you know, and testosterone will be after that. It's going to, you build a ton more tissue with tests than you would with taking insulin. Mm-hmm. Um, and again, mo- there are risks. Like it's one of those things that you can use 99 times correctly and use it wrong once and have a disaster. Yeah. You know, how many bodybuilders crash their car leaving the gym? Cause they go hypo, right? Cause you get that weird biphasic something, right? You mm-hmm. might think you're on top of it and all of a sudden then your blood sugar crashes again. Mm-hmm. Um, so I just, I think people just need to be careful with the way they use it yeah. and use it wisely and maybe don't leverage it so hard if you don't need it. Well, the, the question would be, do they need it, right? Because Most if it, guys it, don't. Because if it's being presented as more anabolic than it's not. X, Y, and Z, and it's not, you know, then what's the reason that it's being put in there? You know, uh, that's, I think, because people think that it's going to be something, right? They read that the big pros use it, so they think yeah. that they need this stuff. Like, again, when you were 300 pounds, the amount of food it takes to be 300 pounds of muscle and move that stuff might require insulin. Well, the right. way that I've heard it explained is it will shuttle more carbohydrate into the muscle. Yeah. I mean, assuming your pancreas isn't working. I mean, most people, <laughs> my pancreas works just fine. I, my fasting glucose is 77. If I took insulin, it would kill me. Mm-hmm. Right. My A1C, even on 
if I took 18 units, of, if I took a bottle of serostim a day, my A1C doesn't go over a five. So yeah. my, my insulin's not helping me at that point. Mm -hmm. um, so I think it's more about knowing your body too. Like if, you're, if your A1C is creeping up and you feel like the amount of food it takes to get to that next level requires more assistance. And that's the time to leverage a hormone like insulin, not just like prophylactically because you heard it was cool. Yeah. Well, that's how it's- That seems so silly to me. Yes. You know, yeah. and again, it goes back to like, learn the, the like cycle design and the progression of a cycle, right? You know, I also noticed with most of my guys, I might have two pros that probably need to stay on insulin all the way into a show. Most of them have to stop. They go hypo. Mm -hmm. Once you get super lean, you realize, wow, my pancreas actually does work on its own, right? It's in the off season when you're pushing food and your body fat's going over 20% and you're, you're fat at that point. Mm -hmm. You need the insulin to support that. If you don't get as fat, you probably don't need as much or if any. Yeah. You know, well, for some young kids, yeah. it seems absolutely ridiculous to me. Uh, well, some will attribute, you know, the change in physique from, say, Dorian's age, like the mass monsters is attributed to insulin. It's probably a lot of things, Tren, right? The, the, the availability of Tremblone. The switch away probably from, right, a lot of the guys, like the Bob Paris is the Frank Zanes mm -hmm. that actually were concerned with their health and by chance, they're all still alive today. Um, <laughs> they the switch away from what they were doing, like we talked about it before, like the Nandrolone Prima ball, and they were leveraging like human grade, safe, relatively safe, right? Every mm -hmm. drug can be risky, you know, compounds. And they were using relatively smaller amounts. There were guys like Mike Mentor who would just eat whatever he could, mm -hmm. like, you know, he did not care, but he's also not alive anymore. Mm -hmm. um, to switch to like the, the, the different drugs that were available, right? Growth hormone, genotropin was 1985. It became available. Now, again, it was very expensive and probably not that easily, easy to come by, but these guys, the top, top guys had guys that would get them for him, right? That's what you saw basically was you, the Dorian posts a picture he put on Instagram the other day where you can see the difference between whatever the year was. It was like 92 and 93. There's like a massive difference in his size. And he, he even equates that to himself to growth hormone. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, in my experience, growth hormone makes a massive difference in someone's physique size. Yeah. You know, where I think insulin will help you get more nutrients in, but calories are not the limiting factor in muscle growth. So like at a certain point, I'm not sure how much that matters. That yeah. makes sense. Mechanical yeah. tension yeah. is what yeah. drives growth. There is an energy requirement to grow muscle. That being said, that energy requirement is lower than most people think it is. Right. It's generally not thousands of extra calories yeah. a day. I've explained this as well. I'm only repeating stuff because I probably different mm -hmm. audience. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so you see, like, I have a very fast metabolism. I can easily eat 6,000 calories a day. It's not like I'm in a calorie excess. It's that's what I burn. Mm -hmm. So, like, if I need to grow, I need to eat 6,200, 6,300. It's not, so you take a guy that burns 2000 calories a day, does not need to eat 6,000 calories a day to grow muscle. Yeah. yeah. Right? I think that's where people go haywire with the, the food leverage, mm -hmm. right? It doesn't like, if you wanted to grow, you could probably add, you know, a couple hundred grams of carbs extra to your day and you'd put on muscle just fine. Yeah. You don't need to double your food intake, mm -hmm. you know? Well, the, the insulin thing has always been interesting to me as being responsible for that change in physiques because it's always been very easy to get. Like if you, if you need, even in the mid eighties, was it? Yeah. I mean, if you walk into a pharmacy and you basically say, you know, I'm going hypo right now and they don't give you human, it was human uh, R, right. Then they're liable. You're going to fucking die. Okay. Right. So it, it's always, it was always kind of easy to buy without a prescription. In New because, Jersey, it's prescription only. Yeah. Well, it may be that way now. Now, once you get out of human R, I mean, you're not going to get human log. You're not going <laughs> to get, you know, this other stuff, but that was never a problem. You could just go buy it. So it was more, but that what around that same time, growth hormone became more affordable and more accessible. Mm-hmm. Right. So and it's safer before uh, that yeah. time. It was dangerous. Oh yeah. Yes. Cause the human cadaver grow. I mean, yeah. first off you probably weren't getting, no. it, you know, so it's that. Chris Kerman. Yeah. yeah. I mean, they claimed Casey Viator and Mike Menser tried it, but like who even knows if that's the truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But there was, that's the one thing that's always kind of like, well, wait a minute. You know, as I think it's something else, you know, other it could that. just be a combination of all of them. Yes. And also what the, I think the aesthetic changed as well, just in the, in the, 
the, the competitors decided that they were sick of that Greek statue thing and they just wanted to be freaks. Yes. Like Dorian, I mean, he was one of the True. first massive guys and he, he said before, he said, I had a pretty physique when I was younger. Now I want the judges to say, what the fuck when they yeah. see me on stage. And it was rewarded. And, and that's yeah. it. And so they got rewarded for being bigger. So they got bigger. They took whatever it took. The doses of everything went up, mm -hmm. right? He went from, you know, Bob, pa again, I, I don't know actually what he took, but let's say he was taking a, a gram a year to now the guy's taking a gram a day or yeah. whatever, you know, ridiculous amount mm -hmm. that some of these guys use. With all these compounds, if we're looking at, you know, its impact of a heart over a period of time, right? Because it's when, when we're looking at the heart and basically bodybuilders dropping over dead, I'm still, I'm still under the thought that most of those that are dropping dead acutely is diuretic related. Right. So let's take those aside. Right. There's other ones that are just dropping dead, you know, potentially because of long term use in the hypertrophy of the heart, mm -hmm. more or less, over that period of time. Um, how does that play into all this? Because let's say growth hormone, like if somebody's got heart issues, they're probably not going to want to be taking growth Huge hormone. Huge amounts of growth hormones. Regular amounts of growth hormone shouldn't affect it, right? You don't see teenagers with enlarged hearts. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And some, you're talking about left ventricle hypertrophy sure. specifically, yeah. which is yeah. also to some degree is called athlete's heart, right? Anyone who lifts weights is going to have, yeah. or doesn't do an equal amount of cardio is going to have a slightly larger Mm -hmm. You know, you have elevated LVH to some degree. Now, steroid use, all steroids to some degree will cause that, right? There are androgen receptors on the heart. So mm -hmm. again, it goes back to the strength. There are other steroids like trembolone, which can directly cause heart issues by blocking glucocorticoid, glucocorticoid receptors. And that, res that basically causes cardiac issues downstream from doing that. So that one is, that's actually seems to be the, really the only valid side mm -hmm. effect, like actual harmful side effect from Trembolone directly. The kidney stuff and all that stuff, a lot of that was based on case studies and not actually real data, mm -hmm. you know, on organ function. But heart-wise, that one's not good for your heart. Um, so if guys are using, I mean, no joke, guys are using as much as 250 milligrams of Trent a day now. So if you're using grams and grams and grams of this stuff, what do you expect your heart to look like? Yeah. And then on top of it, then you're using a bottle a day of growth. Or you're magnifying all those effects by throwing those things in. We don't see those organ growth, right? You don't see guys with bubble guts with HIV. They're on a bottle a day of serostim. So it's not the, the one drug that causes the issue. It's multifactorial. And then piling tons of food in on top of it yeah. stretches things out and just, you know, also just being too heavy, right? It doesn't, your body doesn't care if it's muscle or fat. Every, every, increment of weight you go up stresses your heart more it takes a ton more stroke volume to push blood when you were 300 pounds yeah. versus now yeah right like if you actually measured your heart function it was worse when you were heavier mm -hmm. it didn't matter if, if it was pure muscle it still has to move the blood so i think just being super heavy eating a ton of food using a ton of drugs on top of it and magnifying the effect is going to got and then yeah and then you add something like diuretic on top of it right yeah i mean what do you expect to happen yeah so what would be the mitigation measures for that? Most guys should be doing some level of cardio. Like if that's your goals to be right. I think something I started doing in more in recent years is I do cardio every day, even in a hotel. First thing I do when I get to a hotel, I figure out where I can eat and where I, there's a treadmill. Um, I think just general taking care of your health. I think not getting too out of shape. I mean, I get it. Like if you're a pro bodybuilder and you're an open, you're going to be a big dude. You yeah. can't stop that. That's not going to stop. That's only going to get bigger. So I can't say don't get big, mm -hmm. but maybe just keep the body composition a little bit better. Everything seems to function. Like if you look at labs, guys seem to generally be healthier, the leaner they are, right? Like I see that during prep, you, you guys switch to harsher compounds and you would expect the metrics on their blood work to go down or, you know, or mm -hmm. worse. And you generally see the opposite. Really? Right. In the off season, when guys are heavier, and even if they're just using Testa Primo or, you know, DECA or whatever, you would, you'd be like, they should be relatively healthy. And with 20% body fat there, everything's skewed. Mm -hmm. like their cholesterol's off. Their triglycerides are off. Their blood pressure's too high. Um, so I think just probably managing your general health would be the first thing. And then perhaps don't leveraging those compounds in the off season, like Tremblone, that are going to make magnify that thing. Or maybe yeah. if you're going to use huge amounts of growth hormone maybe it's not all the time right maybe it's similar to gear maybe it's more of a blast and cruise mm -hmm. maybe it's two to three units for a period of time and then maybe it's 10 or whatever you whatever amount you're using so if they're blasting and then they go into the cruise phase on their labs 
what should they see normalize? Well, you usually see. I mean, in other words, what me what metrics should they actually be watching? Um, m the most obvious ones are going to be like the cholesterol, the lipid markers mm -hmm. should start to come down, right? Those are really the ones you're going to see. ALT and AST are always going to be elevated in bodybuilders or strength athletes yeah. from that stuff in the gym. It doesn't, it's not necessarily unless you're taking orals related to steroid use per se. So that's kind of a skewed thing to yeah. look at, you know? Kidney function, obviously, is super important, but that, again, that shouldn't be getting skewed from drugs. Like, if your kidney markers are off, you probably need to revisit the whole thing and not just cruise at that point. Maybe it's, you got to figure out why your, you know, creatinine is over mm -hmm. a two, like these numbers that are not good. Um, I mean, I just didn't only really look at the whole package, what is actually going on in their body. What about the hemoglobin? Yeah, I mean, that, you know platelet counts equally is important. I think a lot of doctors get really reactive with hemoglobin and hematocrit, but like if the platelet count's not high, it's not like a stroke is eminent, you know, at that point. Mm -hmm. It's it's when the platelet count is high as well, then the blood clearly is very sticky. But yeah, but you don't need a floating like well above the range either, right? You yeah. want to keep it somewhere. But again, hydration, not snoring, um, you know, and giving blood if you need to, to some degree. That doesn't mean as soon as it hits the top of the range, you need to go get blood. It means if it's significantly elevated, you probably want to get rid of some of it. Well, the, the snoring and the sleep apnea has come up a few times. So <clears throat> what are the downsides of sleep apnea that, because we've already covered a couple, but it extends way further than what heart that disease. is. That'll, yes. make your heart, that'll yeah. make your heart fail. Yeah. I mean, diabetes, right? Your mm -hmm. glucose management is horrible when you snore. Your insulin sensitivity is horrible when you snore. It puts a ton of stress on your heart. Um, cortisol is high. It just gonna it just it destroys your body. Sleep is when your body naturally, basically, f brain waves actually flush out the garbage in your brain when you're sleeping. If you're not sleeping, your brain will accumulate things like plaque. Um, it, and pretty much every system in the body is affected by poor sleep. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah. Well, the interesting story with that one is. <clears throat> and it's it, it's it's i get where he was coming from but louis used to when we were training he he used to just crack on people that we get a cpap right and when i would ask him about that his logic was what we're doing here is we're taking somebody who's already weighing way too much right and now we're going to allow them the ability to recover better so they gain more weight, which becomes, and I get where he's coming from. It's you see brilliant. I, I get where it's coming from because the actual answer is they probably need to lose weight, you know, <laughs> to be able to sleep better. But it was so fucked up, you know, when he would first say it without yeah. the context, they'd be like, wait a minute, this is fucked up. And so then it kind of made sense. Yeah, like if they don't that. sleep, they can't get any bigger. Yeah. But it's what, what kind of gets lost in that message is it's not just people that are 300 pound plus or 280 plus. No, it's, it's anybody with a thick neck. Yeah. And my, I mean, mine gets progressively worse the heavier I get. So I'm a two, two, between 205 and 210 now. Yeah. This is like where I feel the best. I'm 5'7". I'm not a tall guy. Um, when I, I've been as heavy as 240, and I couldn't breathe. Mm -hmm. Like, clearly my body was telling me not to be that heavy. You know? Is it still a pain in the ass to go through the process of getting a CPAP? There's online places you can get them now. Yeah. Yeah. I don't think it's the, quite the same as, yeah. you know, once was. And I don't know why a doctor wouldn't write for one. Like well, what? it's, I mean, when I had to get, it was a long time ago. It was a pain in the ass. I mean, you had to go I mean, fucking see the right doctor, do a write, sleep study yeah, and all this I mean, other bullshit. That's, that's stupid. They yeah. should just, uh, I don't know what the, what, where's the harm in giving a CPAP? Where's yeah. the abuse? Well, I'm sure you can buy one used on yeah. the marketplace. Although I don't know if I want to use yeah. CPAP. Well, yeah, yeah. Well, you can change the hose, I, I suppose. Guess, yeah. <laughs> there's, there's enough shit in there that you could probably yeah. change out, but <clears throat> were there any other topics that you wanted to go over I didn't bring up? I'm not sure. I don't, n nothing specific. What, what are, are some of the things that you're seeing just currently, like that's trending now that's just kind of fucked up? If it's diet related, PED related, because these things kind of, they go in waves. Yeah, it is funny, right? Because we, yeah. we, you and I have lived through several of them when they come back, right? It's yeah. like low carb, high fat that keeps going back and forth. Yes. Um, I'm waiting for the low fat to come back. <laughs> well, I mean, all my guys, all my guys are low fat. Are they really? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, and if they're enhanced, the fat's 20, 30 grams a day. Oh, really? I mean, my only fat most days is from fish oil. I take four grams of fish oil, mm -hmm. uh, bio test, so it's yeah. from T Nation. Um, and whatever incidental fat there is in the meat I'm consuming, but not a ton, right? When I'm at home, I might use some flaxseed oil mm -hmm. in the morning. 
don't really need, well, you're not synthesizing hormones with it, right? So in your brain, your brain is mostly using DHA from the fish oil. Yeah. The fish oil is basically the last stop in that train. So if you go to that, all the other fatty acids in the human body outside of ALA and LA, that's in flaxseed oil, your body can synthesize. Yeah. So you don't need, it's not like olive oil is not an essential, oleic acid that's in olive oil is not an essential fatty acid. Your body can synthesize that. The benefit of olive oil is not actually in the fat. It's in the purifins from the oleopurifins from mm -hmm. the olives. So it's so then your diet manipulation is all on the carb side. Generally, I mean, yeah. I think carbs and carbs and fat are are reversely correlated. So like sure. on low lower carb days, I'll bring the fat. Yeah, up yeah, slightly. yeah. I just generally don't bring guys fat. Men at least, I don't generally bring their fat over fifty or sixty grams at the top end if they're unless they're really big. But um, women tend to need a little more and feel better with a little more fat. Mm -hmm. I don't coach a ton of women, but I have a couple of female athletes and the one of them, I think her fat's at, you know, 60 or 70 grams. Now she's only 120 pounds, but she feels better. Yeah. She performs better like that. But yeah, for, for most guys I do, it's mostly the car, like protein's pretty much set, right? Yeah, like yeah, I don't, yeah, it's yeah, not yeah. a variable yeah. I generally play with. Like maybe like peaking someone for a show, I might pull it really down just to clear their stomach out or, or, or perhaps there's some variation on different days, depending on the fluctuation between a high day and a low day. Yeah, right? that's Maybe the only more protein I've just seen. to fill them up. Yeah, like if but it's again, a super that's, high day, I've seen protein you come bring down. It down because you can't fit in your stomach. Yeah. But it's like, how much effect that actually has, I don't know. Mm -hmm. It's more, and the fat again is, you know, it, it moves, but it's just, it's to me, it's a tiny bit. And it's just the carbohydrates that we're playing with. Mm -hmm. It's just, that that's really what moves the needle. So on the PED front, what are you saying? The most That's common trending. right now is yeah. test and primo. Would, Seems yeah, to be the common agree, thing. Yeah. I think, and again, I, I don't think there's anything wrong with it. I think primo is a great drug. I think it becomes the two issues that I see. It becomes a cost issue at a certain point, right? Because if you're looking at a bottle, a primo for the cost versus a bottle of testosterone, you know, for the current street price, you could probably get three bottles of test for a price mm -hmm. primo. So I think that's why for years, guys kind of avoided leveraging it advanced guys, at least. Cause if you need a gram of something, mm -hmm. you use a gram of something that's the most expensive drug. It yeah. made a lot of sense to me, but I don't think there's anything wrong with that. I think that's probably smarter stacking than some of the stuff you've seen in the past, at least. Right. And you, cause you can always add back to that, right. You can add, you know, if it's like a show prep, you could always add Mastron in there. You could always add a Nandrolone on top of that, like similar to what was done, mm -hmm. you know, a long time ago. There's lots of ways I think you could go with that. And I think from a safety point of view, it's going to be one of the safer ways to stack something. What's the difference between Mastron and Primo? Totally different drugs. Yeah. So like, I think that's when guys that have never taken chemistry try to oversimplify chemistry. They're like, yeah. well, they're both DHTs. Yeah, that's why. What, what the heck does yeah, that mean? Yeah. Like, so- Nandrolone and Tremblone are both 19 nores, like short of that methyl group on carbon 19. There is not a single similarity between the two <laughs> drugs. They're literally polar opposites, right? So Nandrolone is, has progestogenic activity and Tremblone actually acts as an antagonist to that receptor, right? It's, it binds to it, sure, but it's not activating gene response there. It's, it's totally different structure. So Masteron and Primo, um, I think from a cycle standpoint, they're relatively interchangeable. They can be, right? I think a lot of times you see guys struggling to find general and primo. And so they might add master on its place. You can do it. I don't think they function similarly at all. Like primo to me is, is a better growth leverage. Um, you're a little fuller. I think you recover a little better on it. Master on to me is like, if you want to look dry and hard mm -hmm. right? and it, want, it ages you, I feel like it ages your face and stuff. Um, Primo metabolizes into an anti-estrogen to an AI and no one knows what Mastron actually does. So it doesn't really seem to affect estrogen in serum that much. Yeah. And we don't know. It literally never studied. So, Which makes it really convenient to be the catch-all for whatever benefits you want. It yeah. To be. You can, people just love to pin stuff. The only interaction we know it has an interaction with sex hormone binding globulin outside of that, we don't know and hmm. we never will know. So it was invented with, um, Mastron was invented at the same time by Syntex and Lilly. So they had a joint project that they were working on and they invented Anadrol, Mastron, and Superdrol at the same time. The Superdrol is actually called Superdrol not as a play on words. It's because it's super saturated with oxygen. So it's actually a chemical mm -hmm. reasoning for that name. It wasn't some catchy thing that they added on in the 90s. And Superdrol, when they ran the initial tests on it, Superdrol was toxic. So they were like, screw this, they shelved it. And then it didn't come back until that supplement company found it years later. Mm -hmm. um, Anadrol seemed to grow tissue the best of those two. And so 
they pushed for FDA approval for wasting and anemia and all these things because it seems to do a ton of stuff with blood, red blood cell count. So that's the direction it went in Masteron in the original studies. It didn't seem to do a whole lot with tissue. It seemed to stop tissue growth with with cancer and stuff. So they were like, it's an anti-proliferic agent. So the FDA approved for breast cancer. They never further studied it for anabolism. It's never been written for anabolism. It's not, it's not in any medical book going back to its inception ever showing it to be prescribed for that reason. So no pharmaceutical company ever looked at it. There was, there was one study I know of, and there might be more, where they gave it to women with cancer, and sure enough, they gained a kilo of weight. But again, you're talking women with terminal cancer in bed. If you gave them creatine, they would gain weight. Yeah. So I, I don't know if that really translates into real world stuff. I'm not saying Mastron doesn't build tissue. I'm sure it does, but to what degree, I don't know. Mm -hmm. and no one can say it is effective as this, because they're not basing that on anything. Yeah, it's anecdotal okay. at a certain point with your non-competitive clients that are say over 40 that have a decent training history what would be the compounds that you would advise them just to avoid in at all just not mess with at all any of the 19 ores right mint trestolone mint mm -hmm. um tren obviously check drops <laughs> I don't know, anyway. <laughs> um yeah, that brings you know, and memory. even honestly, nandrolone, most guys don't need nandrolone. Like, I think the problem is we've also grown, like everyone just wants a drug. It's very American. We want a drug for everything. So it's like, I'm yeah. my elbows. What do I add? Yeah. I had DECA. Well, I, if your elbows are hurting, yeah. why don't you look at your diet first? Are you taking yeah. like, what, what does your food look like first? What's your training look like first? Maybe don't do skull crushers if they bother you. Yeah. It's I've like always questioned you know, that it's, It seems like so to me. Now, sure. Will it work? It can. Is it permanent? No. As soon as you come off the deck of the joints hurt again. So it's yeah. like, you didn't fix anything. Um, and I also just think it's harsh for, for someone older. And it causes, seems to cause a lot of psychological issues, especially in older men. Just it seems like a silly choice. I mean, I would typically steer them. If they need something else outside of test, it, it would typically be a DHT. And, and again, what do you come down to? You come down to basically Primo and Mastron. Out of ours, a great drug, but like, do you really want to burden someone's kidneys for no reason? Mm -hmm. And you could leverage the same thing with Primo. Yeah. I don't know. That's why I would look at it. Is I would rather safety and a little bit, because how much muscle does that guy need? Right. Does he need, you know, tons of gear to get to his goal? No, he probably needs to do cardio and eat better. Mm -hmm. Right. And the gear is just allowing him to get there a little faster, you know, than maybe without, but it's not like... It's not like a pro body, but we need freakish shit going on to, to yeah. win a show. But they'll be influenced by that stuff that's out there. Yeah. Right? But again, so. a lot of the, I mean, that's what you see, at least in the, I would, I would say the, the lifestyle middle-aged guy, it, it's more reflective of what the pros would do in a cruise, mm -hmm. right? That's what a lot of those guys cruise on. They cruise on Test and Primo. When it's time for a cycle, that's not what they cruise on, but there might still be Primo in there someplace, but it's generally used show prep if it's added in that stack or it's used in a cruise, it's typically yeah. not like a massing drug for most of those guys. Um, whereas they would use EQ or something, but again, like I don't think lifestyle guys need to mess with things like that. It just, there's just, to me, there's no point. It's not a first call drug. Yeah. Well, what I see is <clears throat> the older generation guys that are going to fall into there, you know, they're, they're going to kind of like default back if they've been using for a while, like test DECA, D ball, mm -hmm. right? That's going to be like the go to. Then the the attractive, shiny one's going to be the trend because they're like, fuck, we never had that, you know. And it I works. And it's, I think I've always been working under this false assumption that parabolin was essentially trend. Is that not true? It is trend. Okay. Okay. So just right, as a different okay. ester. Yeah. Because it's, <clears throat> that was one of the things that was interesting to me, you know, because I would hear trends have been around for a long time and it's like, has it then 1967 it, yeah, then it was parabolin and then well, before yeah. that it was the french company it was basically injectable acetate first oh yeah for cattle yeah and then they realized that if you sell it as an injectable acetate humans are going to use it so then they made it into a pellet yeah i to remember stop that. that so but you acetate was actually first then parabolin came out but they were exploring even long estered trend as early as 1967 their studies they're not public access stuff, so no, it, there's no point in putting a link there because people are not going to be able to read them. Yeah. They're owned by, Merck owns the majority of the rights of this stuff because they acquired the Tremblone rights. But the, uh, the all that stuff, they've been looking at the trend since the 60s. Yeah, there, were, there was a, 
I already told the story about how I would compare, you know, the drugs, all that. And it's the parabolin, you know, was essentially, it, I connected it to being trend, you mm -hmm. know, just by kind of looking at the ingredients. It's more like trendy. Yeah. And when you were Western. talking about the implants, there was a period of time to where it was really hard to find stuff. And so I was taking the pellets, mm -hmm. you know, and that was an interesting fucking time, by the way. Um, and, and not the way that most did. What, DMSO? Were you no, inhaling it? No, I would cook it on a stove. Okay, but you were injecting it though still? Yeah. Because some guys were inhaling it too. Yeah, no, I would just basically freebase it. So okay. just put the oil on the spoon, oh, yeah. put it over a gas stove and not separate the binders and just blow everything in Which there. Which you, uh, you could do back then, not healthy, but you could do. Now you can't because it's polymer in them. Oh. That's part of the reason why they changed the coating to a polymer. So you, you basically have plastic that you can't, you can't, you and I don't have the ability at home to get rid of that Palmer. Wow, that'd be fucked up. Yeah, well that's, yeah. Well, no one yeah, in the right yeah, mind yeah, is buying yeah. Revlar X yeah, or whatever yeah, to yeah. like do at home, because you could just get Trend anywhere you want now. Yeah, yeah. You also don't have to resort to that, but that's mm -hmm. part of the reason why they did the, the Palmer, is it, it is actually a great way to control the release, but it also stops people from stealing their stuff, right? Because it wasn't technically an outlaw drug. So the Trevlone yeah. actually snuck under the FDA regulations or the DEA regulations with steroids, because the problem is if it were a class three drug, it would require a, a, a veterinarian to write a prescription for it. So you got a guy right down the street, yeah. right? It's a thousand head of cattle and yeah. he needs trend. Yeah. So the vet's going to go write one for every single cow. Can't do that. They, no one's going to do that. So they, they were like, well, this is a veterinary only drug. So, you know, to, to make it easier, you can just go to Agway and buy the boxes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's but what then we were people doing. were abusing it. Yeah, yeah so then just, they had to change the formula so you couldn't yeah, use it. Well, you could still get it that way. You just you'd be out of your mind to try it like that. No, I didn't know that because it, it was interesting. Because at that time, it you know there was, I think it was the same time period where they were clamping down on the Mexican border, mm -hmm. right? And the drugs didn't start coming from Russia, Ukraine, all yep. these other places yet. So there was just a weird, weird fucking time to where it was like heparoid, finiplex, yep. you know, all these implants that you would just call a cattle supply shop to yep, have it sent to you. Then it's like. Fuck, it'd be a big ass gun. You know, they would send <laughs> yeah. with it. You got a free gun with three pal, you know, three yeah. packs or whatever, and then figuring out how to actually cook them, yeah, with cook it, filter you know, stuff. or filter, yeah. you know. And it's like I'm not a chemist. I'm not going to deal with that filtering shit. We'll just do it this other way. Works. Which, yeah, but it went now. You know, so yeah. it, that because it, sometimes it, the well, it was the hot binders, when you were putting it in too, right? Yeah, it was a process. Yeah, because otherwise, know? if it cooled, it would solidify. Yeah, it. yeah, because if if you if you pulled it too soon it would melt the syringe Oof. you know so you i guess i could go i mean you wait till it just originally yeah, no dissolved. one can do it anymore anyways, they can't so do it matter. so there'd be like, like a little cloud that would form in there and then as soon as the clouds start dissipate mm -hmm. boom but then you had to go straight you know to <laughs> my my stove was maybe three steps away from the sink so it would be one you know heat it pull it one two three four five under cold water then you had to go immediately because really? if you waited it's too solidified. long it would start to bind you know so the binders would start to rebind in the syringe and you'd never be able to get it through <laughs> right so eventually then it's hot right so as soon as you take it you know, have like a trend cough, but not because it's essentially trend. Because it's just, you just put hot it's oil because in it's you. fucking hot oil you just put in there. And then hope to hell that it wouldn't clump up, you know, and make this yeah. big fucking. So, because people ask all the time, I'll just, the, the trend, real trend cough yeah. is when you puncture a vein, right? Oh, so it okay. happens all the time because you can't see them in there. Yeah. And that what that basically is, it's a prostaglandin response. Where it causes bronchial constriction and it's from a micropulmonary embolism. So people ask all the time what that is. So basically you put it in a vein, it circulates, goes to your lungs. Your lungs don't like the sensation of oil in them. Mm -hmm. So then they try to constrict your, your airway to force it out. And then you start to cough to get the oil out. It can happen technically with any steroid, but acetate specifically because a portion of it unbinds to the acetate ester immediately. It, it's very active versus trenonanthate. Parabol never caused that cough. Yeah. Um, but that's, but that's what that is. People wonder. Pulmonary embolism yeah. is scary as yeah. fuck. But the, um, well, micro. I'm micro, but I don't still, give a no, shit. You, don't you want still it. stick those well, other words. Get it. So medically, if you get um, if you get it from testosterone, because it's some guys do get it from mm -hmm. TRT, you need to have an X-ray on your chest done, because if you have oil actually in your lungs, you got big problems. Yeah. Um, not common, but it happens. But wow. with the trend, it clears right away, mm -hmm. and it's the worst thirty seconds of your life. Oh yeah. You feel that happening? Oh yeah. You start to sweat. Mm -hmm. Um, 
But yeah, that's, but the prostaglandin response is also what causes the stem, stem cell proliferation from trend. So that's part of the reason why that drug works so well. Oh, so it means it's working. And yeah. So, <laughs> and that's one of the reasons. So I won't, I'm not going to go into detail uh, like full length about this. We could always do another thing mm -hmm. about this, but basically the reason why trend acetate is used in cattle and not the longer esters. Cause you could just say, well, why use pellets to slow the reason when you could just put an ester on it because the prostaglandin response is much stronger from the acetate than it is from the longer ester trend. Hence you get more satellite cells in the cattle and they'll grow more tissue. So in theory, it doesn't mean that trinacetate will necessarily do that, but that's at least the scientific theory behind it. So they, mm -hmm. what they did is they used the trinacetate and then they put a polymer around it to slow its release down because they still want that base chemical. Mm -hmm. They don't want, they don't want a long ester trend in there. Yeah. What would be the best way for people to get a hold of you? Uh, I'm most active on Instagram. Okay. Kurt.Havens. Yep. And I do have a YouTube channel. I need to put more content up. It's been, this is competition season. So I have several guys every weekend competing or in peak week. So it's not been a ton of time to film anything on my own. Yeah. Um, the same thing, Kurt.Havens, YouTube. Um, I, I Kurt at AtomicLifeCoaching.com. I have a website. Um, I do answer emails. I answer DMs. I try to answer all DMs. Even the silly ones. Um, yeah, I think right. that's... Uh, the yeah, we'll have all the links in the bio. Do you have any final thoughts? No, um, I'm, I'm honored to, to be here. It's pretty cool to sit across the table from someone who I... I read your content yeah. for years when I was younger and always looked up to you, which is pretty wild to now, yeah. you know, be part of this. Thank you, and thank, thank you, you for what you do and keep putting this stuff Thanks, out. Man. It's great. All right, we're done. <clears throat> All right, guys, thanks for watching the video to the end. Make sure to like and subscribe to the channel and click here, 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 or here for more videos.